question. Okay, Stephanie. Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Careers Roadshow. Uh, and this is our Science Week edition, even though Science Week was last week, but there's still plenty going on uh, for much of the month of November. So I hope you got a chance to attend some Science Week events or even to have some in your schools. Uh, we have a series of these road shows, shows where we bring you uh, scientists and engineers working in the space sector to share their STEM education and career experiences. Um, and this is a really, a really great opportunity for you to see some of the, the chances and the opportunities that are out there for all of you. Um, at the outset, I also want to thank my colleagues in Blackrock Castle Observatory who manage this event on behalf of Azero Ireland. Rob, Danielle and Alan are all uh, here today, um, moving you from main room to breakout rooms and moderating breakout rooms and managing the event. So thanks so much to the team in Blackrock Castle Observatory. Um, also want to, of course, to mention our fantastic Master of Ceremonies for today, Neve Shaw. Uh, Neve will be keeping us all on track and uh, chatting to all the speakers at various stages. So thanks a million, Neve. Um, and looking forward to a really exciting event. Just quickly to show you the, the, the schedule for the day. So I'm here now just for a couple of minutes just to share this uh, opening with you. Uh, I'll hand over to Neve very shortly. Uh, and then we go straight on to our speakers, a um, Aidan Cowley, Laura Hayes and Lawrence O'Rourke from the European Space Agency. Of course, our theme for today is Irish scientists and engineers working at the European Space Agency. After each of the speakers, different schools will have a chance to go into breakout rooms with individual speakers where you'll have a chance to chat more in depthly with them. So please take this opportunity, make sure to um, take any notes during their presentation, ask any questions that you have and really make the best of, of this experience for yourselves. After that then, after the speakers, I will tell you a little bit more about Zero Ireland and the resources and the opportunities and the competitions and the projects that we have on offer. Uh, then we'll do a Q&A with a panel. Um, we'll be, there is a prize for the best questions asked today. So we'll wrap up at the very end with that. And we hope to be finished uh, by about 11.45 this morning. So really, I really want to sincerely thank our speakers for giving their time today. Dr. Aidan Cowley is part of the Exploration, Preparation, Research and Technology team, um, and he's based at the ESA Astronaut Centre in Cologne in Germany. Uh, Dr. Laura Hayes is relatively new to ESA, and she is a solar physicist who currently works as a research fellow at the European Space Agency. Um, and she's at the European Space Research and Technology Centre, or ESTEC, and that's in Noordwijk in the Netherlands. Um, and Dr. Lawrence O'Toole then has worked at the European Space Agency since 1996. He has been located at three of his establishments in ESTEC, ESOC, and is currently at the European Space Astronomy Centre near Madrid in Spain. Um, and Lawrence is both an, a, an engineer and a scientist, so has huge experience to share with us today. Um, I'm going to hand over to Neve, but to sincerely thank these people for giving up their today. Uh, as I mentioned, and you'll know from the names even of these people giving up their time today, the theme is Irish scientists and engineers working at, at um, ESA or the European Space Agency. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about your, your guys and your experience. And thank you so much again. Thanks, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone, and happy Science Week. I know Science Week uh, officially finished um, last week, but there are still some events happening this week, and even there's some kind of trailing into next week, so um, there's still a chance to get involved. And a massive part of Science Week this year is this campaign about creating our future. Stephanie will talk about it later, but if you've heard about it, uh, basically uh, it's an opportunity for you to tell Ireland and the research community, what are your concerns about the future? So you can find out more at creatingourfuture.ie. Um, every single idea is given consideration and, uh, and discussed. And so who knows, you could have the best idea for how we can be build a better future for Ireland. So that's creatingourfuture.ie. So um, I love being a part of the Space Careers Roadshow and thank you very much, Stephanie, for inviting me to moderate the session and 
it's always lovely to work with Blackrock Castle Observatory. The crack team of Rob, Danielle and Alan are working things in the background. Stephanie has kind of taken you through the, the, the whole procedure of the morning. Uh, we really want you to engage as much as possible in this morning because this is your event about uh, finding out what you need to know about having a career in the space sector. And we have three fantastic speakers from Ireland who are involved in different aspects, um, working at the European Space Agency, who are, who are willing and ready and able and keen to answer your queries. And you'll get that chance in the breakout room. Rob will be joining you in each of those breakout rooms and Rob's keeping an eye on what kind of questions you're going to ask because there is a prize at the end for the very best question. And there's also a session at the end, uh, a, a larger question and answer session. We really want to hear your, uh, your questions and the best question gets a great prize. Rob, what do people get? What is the prize this time around for the best question? I don't know if Rob's coming on camera there or Alan. Can either of you tell us about what the best prize is? What what uh, what the prize is for best question? I know. I I I I'll just jump in and say it. They're busy. Uh, what you get is you get uh, East. Oh, is Rob? Yeah, uh, Rob. Go on. Tell us what's the prize. Uh, the prize is a really, really cool um, ESA slash uh, space pack. So it's mostly ESA prizes. We've got really cool ESA hoodies and ESA stationery um, and all that kind of thing. But we also have one or two cool little NASA things for our American uh, buddies. We have to acknowledge them too. Like little NASA pop sockets, but it's it's mainly an ESA one because ESA is cooler. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. So there you go. Like it's well worth. So we want to hear your questions, but also this is your opportunity to find out about your careers. And um, and we have three people from very diverse sectors and who are going to uh, explain their careers now. So I've said enough. Let's just get going because this thing always goes over time. So let's just get cracking. And I'm going to call um, our first speaker, Aidan, to uh, come and say hi. So hello. Hi, Aidan. How are you? And where are you this morning? Hey, Nathan. Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, I'm calling to you guys from uh, sunny Cologne in Germany, uh, not far from the European National Centre. Brilliant. Great stuff. And uh, you are a science officer working at the Astronaut Centre, the EAC, aren't you? So, Aidan, are you ready to tell us a little bit about your career? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have a couple of slides okay. here, so I will share my screen and Lovely. I'll talk to you through um, what I have Thank you. in a second here. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, I can see it. It looks great. All good. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to talk to you guys this morning. Uh, as Neve said, I'm a scientist. I work here at the European National Centre in Cologne. And before I start talking a little bit about myself and how I ended up here, uh, I wanted to explain to you one of the the the, the actual National Centre because it's it's a it's a fascinating facility. It's where I work, and uh, it gives you a flavour for the kind of um, uh, places that a scientist can end up working in, in Europe uh, within ESA. So here's a picture of, of, of our uh, astronaut center. This is where I work in, in Cologne. Uh, it's one of the smaller ESA sites. So compared to my colleagues, Lawrence and Laura, um, uh, it's actually one of the smallest ESA sites, but we have uh, really a lot of exciting and interesting activities at the center. The, the astronaut center is essentially the home uh, for uh, the astronaut core. So all the human spaceflight activities of ESA and necessarily uh, flow through this facility. It's been established since 1990. Uh, we are the, the, the home office for all the astronauts, so we know all the astronauts, we work with them all the time. Uh, we have a, a frontline seat to actually understanding what's involved in flying humans to space. Um, not only do we support and train the astronauts, but we're also involved on supporting and training uh, other ESA um, um, elements, for, so for example, training the, the people who operate ISS activities and so forth. We also have a space medicine team here whose job it is to look after um, the rehabilitation of the astronauts, and there's a lot of scientists working in that team as well. So it's a very diverse, very fascinating place to work, and uh, it's a real privilege to be working here, and we get to play uh, get to work at the forefront of human spaceflight exploration, which is a a great thing to be able to say in one's career. The team itself that we have here at EAC then is made up of, of a very diverse cast and this is one of the great things about EAC. We have, we have people from all different backgrounds. We have astronauts of course, we have trainers, uh, we have medical operations, we have astronaut support, we have crew operation tasks, we have public relations and through all those activities, through all these positions, 
there is a strong theme of having science backgrounds. Nearly all my colleagues come from a STEM type background and we need that. We need people who, who work in cooperations but have science background, people who work in public relations but understand what they're talking about when we talk about the science we're doing aboard the station. So science is at the heart of what we do at EAC. The core thing we do at the centre is, support, is supporting the ISS. Uh, of course, many of you know this already. Um, ISS is a, is a great multinational project uh, combining the space agencies of USA, uh, Russia, Japan, Canada and Europe. Uh, it's one of the largest partnerships in science to have existed uh, in history. And the station allows for a permanent crew of, of six to nine people to be on station uh, carrying out scientific experiments in this unique environment. And it's been running there now since 1999. It's a, a permanently manned habitat that we have been orbiting the Earth. Um, and we as ESA uh, get to use this facility because we're part of this consortium. And we are involved in supporting uh, the astronaut flights to the station here at the Astronaut Center. Um, but we're also involved in, in supporting the, the crew training of, for all the different experiments. So we also have to train the astronauts on how to operate all the equipment uh, on board the space station and so forth. Here you can see an actual picture of inside our center. This is our training hall, just to give you guys a flavor for the kind of facilities that we have available to ourselves. Uh, this is a bird's eye view of our, of our wonderful training hall. And inside this training hall, we have all these life-size mock-ups of the ISS modules. Um, and this is what we use to, to train the astronauts. Here, we can put them in a simulation. Uh, we can train them uh, in a high fidelity environment representative of what they would experience as if they were on board the station. And this is where they get their, their, ba their basic training. Um, they also go to other facilities in Houston and also facilities in Russia to complete the training for those segments. But each country um, that's part of the ISS agreement has to maintain its own training facilities. And this is where we, as ESA, maintain the European training facilities at our base here in Cologne. Here you can see what it looks like inside our, our Columbus module. So just to give you a flavor for it, it's a lot tidier here on Earth than it is in space. In space, you have a lot more wires and, and bits and pieces uh, floating around. Um, but we here uh, keep ours a little bit tidier. Uh, and this is an example of the kind of facility we would use for, for training the astronauts um, at EAC. Uh, we also have a, a, a diving pool. Um, so this is one of the um, facilities we use for training the astronauts for EVAs, so extra vehicle activities. Uh, so this is where the astronauts would, would spend time underwater uh, training on how to traverse themselves around a module like the Columbus module or any other ISS module for that matter. And they get the basic familiarization for operating a spacesuit here before they go to Houston, where they get trained fully on the, on the EVA suits that are currently used on um, board the um, ISS. So of course, you can't mention the astronauts out there without mentioning the astronauts. Uh, we've got an active roster then of seven astronauts at the moment, uh, all from different nationalities, all from different member states of the European uh, Space Agency. And of course, uh, if any of you have been paying attention recently, we've also announced uh, a new recruitment campaign for new astronauts. So um, these things seem to happen once every 10 years or so. So who knows, maybe some of you people uh, who are listening today might have a chance to participate in the next uh, astronaut recruitment campaign. And then lastly, just to talk a little about the future going forward. So everything we're doing at the moment is focusing on ISS, but one of my jobs is looking to the future. And I'll be talking more about this in a second. Um, and one of the exciting things that we're looking to do now in the agency is move beyond just ISS. We're looking to return to the moon uh, to support exploration activities around the moon and also on the surface of the moon. And, and basically this is uh, our next destination, so to speak. So we're not only going to be present and working on low Earth orbit with the ISS, but we're also going to be going to the moon, uh, carrying out science and exploration activities on the surface of the moon. And it's a little bit why I am at EAC and what I'm doing at the, at the center. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. But now to, to kind of jump onto the point of, you know, who I am and what exactly do I do at ESA and how did I end up here? Um, a bit about myself, um, I'm Irish UK, multidisciplinary scientist, I'm a huge, huge space enthusiast. Ever since I was a young person, I've been fascinated and driven by space exploration. It's what's motivated me to pursue a, a, a career in science. Um, and it's, 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 it's given me a, a, an incredible passport to go see and do and work with amazing people in the science, in the space uh, industry. Um, but how I got here is a little bit unorthodox. I didn't start off as an aerospace engineer. 
uh, I didn't come in um, with a medical background or anything like that. I actually started off in my bachelor's uh, in computer applications. So actually my primary training is as a programmer, as a computer programmer. Um, and there actually are roles for that kind of job uh, within ESA. Um, but I didn't at the time think that this was actually something that would, would get me there. I, the reason I did computer programming at the time was because I loved it. I really enjoyed programming as a really creative and fun and, 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 and enticing career at the time. But having finished my degree in, in, in computer applications, I realized I would like to perhaps spend uh, a bit more time doing more, uh, something a bit different. So after I finished my degree in, in computer applications, I went on to do a master's in electronic systems. And this essentially uh, gave me a, a more background in hardware. So not only was I able to now program at a high level, but I could also uh, tinker around with electronics and build things uh, at a reasonably decent level. So now not only, I could actually program and also work with the, the, the hardware, which was a very nice um, um, progression. Um, I worked then for a couple of years, uh, mostly in the, in the area of systems administration and IT support. And then after about two years after graduating from my master's, I went on and joined, um, uh, um, sorry, I, I was offered an opportunity to, to do a PhD. Uh, and this was in the area of semiconductor and material science. And I have to admit, uh, I actually had no background in that particular area, but my professor at the time said, don't worry about it, Aiden, we'll train you up. You have enough skills uh, that we can actually make this work. And, and in truth to his word, um, uh, in my PhD, I was exposed to a, a wonderful world of material science and uh, they gave me a lot of training and, and by the time I finished this I, I was completely hooked I, I, I love material science and I find actually it complements very very well my computer applications and electronics background so not only can I now program at a high level I can also build the hardware that you that you run the programs on right down to a transistor level and um, so this was a real kind of achievement for me to be able to talk you through every stage of how a computer works right down to the the very finest details of, of uh, the transistor technology. So after I graduated my PhD, I spent some time working then as a lecturer and researcher at DCU. Uh, I was mostly working in the area of material science, but also a little bit of energy. And at this stage, then I began to look at opportunities uh, to see if I could, you know, fulfill my lifelong ambition of working for uh, ESA, for, for, for a space agency. And I applied for a position um, in 2013 at STEC our technical center in the Netherlands. Uh, I was unsuccessful, but I was runner up. So basically I was the second choice for a position. And this, while it was a bit of a personal defeat, was actually a huge motivating factor for me because I realized that there were people who were interested in my CV and background and that I was somebody who could work for ESA. And, uh, and then in 2014, I saw another position opening up at the astronaut center. And this one was actually much better suited for me in terms of the background requirements. And I applied for it and I got it. So I joined uh, the agency in 2014 as a research fellow based here at the uh, astronaut center in Cologne. I continued my career then as, an uh, as a research fellow um, uh, until 2017 when uh, I applied for a job uh, within the agency itself, a full staff position. And, and was successful and uh, I joined then as a science officer in 2017 and my current role is to essentially lead uh, the spaceship EAC team which I'll tell you more about in a second and I'm part of a bigger team within ESA called EXPERT um, you probably know um, within, within, within space we love our acronyms but EXPERT stands for Exploration Preparation Research and Technology and essentially this team is the front line of research and technology development for ESA as we step forward beyond uh, missions to the ISS. So I managed to end up in a position where I'm literally on the cutting edge of what we're doing for exploration uh, within ESA. And that's a, a huge, huge achievement for me and exceptionally exciting. So what is Spaceship BAC? Well, this is what I kind of like to visualize it as. Uh, Spaceship BAC essentially is an innovation team. Uh, imagine taking the, uh, the problem solving skills of MacGyver combining it with a deep love of human spaceflight, and you end up with this uh, Spaceship EAC team. And this is the team that I lead at the moment. And uh, our job essentially is looking into how we can help uh, the agency prepare for exploration to, uh, to places like the moon. And we, we cover a hugely diverse range of topics. We look into things like advanced manufacturing, we look into robotics, we look into energy systems for the moon, uh, we look into offer living, i.e. how can we help our astronauts survive on places like the moon. 
we look into uh, space resources. So what, what resources can we find locally to, uh, to support our, um, our future exploration missions? And now we also look into disruptive technologies, which is a kind of a catch-all for new innovative ideas and how they might be able to enhance exploration. So for example, you know, how can we use perhaps AI to support our astronauts on the surface of the moon? Um, here you can see on the right the picture of my team taken last year. This is uh, during the COVID uh, lockdown, so we're all off-site. Um, but one thing you'll see about it is it's made up of uh, uh, a lot of uh, young people, which is, which is great, because I actually now get to work uh, with some exceptionally experienced people uh, within ESA, but also have a lot of young people working with me too. And this makes uh, for a really fantastic combination because you have the innovation and creativity of the younger generation combined with the experience and the uh, the understanding of space that comes from the people who've been uh, with ESA for a longer period of time. And uh, we mix these together to create uh, you know, an environment where new ideas and new technologies can be uh, proposed and, and explored. Um, and this is what Spaceship BAC is essentially about. One picture I like to show is, is, uh, is, is the challenge that we face when we go to somewhere like the moon. So this is a picture uh, of the lunar surface taken uh, during Apollo 16. And most people would say that this is a, a complete desert. There's not much to do or, or use there. Um, but we say, as Spaceship BAC, we say actually there's actually quite a lot of interesting uh, material that could be used here to support and sustain um, um, activities in the moon. So, uh, for example, you can see in the distance uh, these shadowed regions where we think there could be uh, volatiles, uh, water, ice, and other, other useful chemicals stored in, in, that, in those dark areas. Uh, you see the, the lunar surface here. This is covered in this fine powder material, which we call regolith. Uh, so we're looking into how we could actually use that regolith uh, to produce things like oxygen, metals, or even build stuff with this sand uh, to essentially support our exploration activities in the future. So we're trying to take this picture here, MacGyver it, and turn it into something more like this, uh, where you can see a, you know, a sustainable presence on the surface uh, where we're using the resources that, we're, that are local there. Um, and using new technologies and concepts to, to, to support ourselves, to make ourselves sustainable as we return to the moon. And this is what myself and my team are challenged with, is like, how can we make this picture here a reality? What technologies, what techniques uh, do we need to investigate now to, to prepare for this in 10, 15, 20 years time? So that's uh, a little bit the motivation for, for what we do at Spaceship EAC. So then, you know, one of the questions is why did I embark upon a science career and, and you know, why um, uh, go down this particular road? And for me, you know, I could have easily taken a, a, a well-paying job when I finished my computer programming degree. Um, but I always felt that there was more to, to a career. I always felt that for me, a career should be fulfilling on as many levels as possible, not just financial. Uh, so for me, I've always looked at science as a kind of higher calling, something that, you know, uh, you can contribute to that is greater than yourself. Uh, scientists work as part of a, a huge collaboration spanning decades, uh, going back in time and also going into the future. What we do now uh, will help scientists of the future. So all the work and research we do now, it gets built upon by other scientists around the world and by scientists in the future. And this, this to me really appeals to me. It means that what, what I do with my time is valuable. It's actually helping to advance humanity in some meaningful, if, if even just a small way, and that to me was a, a huge inspirational factor for, for choosing science as a career. Uh, the second reason why science as a career is really uh, enticing is, is the large number of, of job opportunities. Uh, genuinely, um, I find that the, the science, um, um, sorry, uh, jobs and, and, and research opportunities opened by science uh, backgrounds, um, it, it seems to be expanding all the time. There's more and more opportunities for people to, to get involved uh, uh, and, and to, to engage with jobs with science backgrounds. Another big bonus and a personal favorite of mine is travel. So one of the cool things about uh, uh, sometimes being a scientist is, is the opportunity to travel. Um, uh, you get to go to scientific conferences, um, you get to visit and meet uh, other researchers, you get to go to labs and use their facilities and so forth. Uh, and also with ESA, um, as a scientist, I've been invited on field campaigns. So you can see a picture of me here in Lanzarote um, it, it's a very tough life to go do this kind of work, as you can see. But um, here I am doing my job uh, in Lanzarote in November in sunny sunshine, uh, carrying out scientific experiments with uh, two other astronauts uh, looking into how we can um, do geology field training uh, for, the, for, for 
how, how we actually do geology field training for, for future astronauts and, and train this up. So uh, this was an opportunity to travel that was enabled to me um, by my background and my, and my, my degrees. Um, science also allows you to become uh, objectively obnoxious, as I like to call it. So uh, you, you, you get trained up on a, on a, a skill set that allows you to critique uh, um, you know, new developments, new techniques, new technologies. Uh, it can make you very unpopular with your friends because you can often have a, a, a cooling opinion on, on, on hot topics. Um, so be warned of that one. And then lastly, you get to work with, with some really incredible minds. So science, you know, attracts scientists, it attracts people of this type of, um, of this type of background. And you get to work with people who get to define the, the, the technology of the future. Um, so for example, on the bottom right here, these are two of my former uh, colleagues who are now working at STEC, and they've been working on uh, developing uh, a new system that can produce oxygen from lunar regolith. Uh, and this is a technology that will you know, uh, live long beyond their, their contribution. Um, um, it'll define future exploration in very, very meaningful ways. And it's so cool to be able to work with incredible minds like that. So another question that people always ask then about, uh, you know, science at ESA is, you know, what kind of uh, backgrounds do you need to have to, to work with us? And it's it's not just material science. There's also uh, a lot of engineers and other backgrounds. So we have mechanical engineers working with us. We have electrical engineers, uh, system engineers, uh, telecoms, software engineering, for example, uh, and, and product quality insurance and safety. So it's not just about materials. It's not just about life sciences or even uh, astronomy. Uh, there's a whole host of people who work with us at ESA who have very different backgrounds, but all come from a, a scientific engineering uh, discipline background. And if, if you're also just, I know this is a, a talk about science, but it's also important to note that, you know, many of my colleagues are not uh, directly coming from a science background. Many of them actually work uh, in other aspects at ESA. So we have people who work with us in the area of law. This is very important. Uh, we have people who manage our projects financially. Uh, we have communications and public relations experts. We have people who work with us in human relations, uh, information technology and facility management and so forth. And it's important to realize that they make up a huge chunk of people who work at ESA as well. Um, so don't ever feel that uh, if perhaps science isn't the career that works out for you. There's not a way to work at the agency uh, because there is. There's many different paths that can lead you um, to working with us uh, at ESA. So on that point, I hope I've given you a flavor for uh, what we do at EAC. I hope I've given you a flavor for a little bit about my, my background uh, and how I ended up uh, working uh, here at the, at the agency. And I hope I've given you a flavor for you know, many different career paths that can lead you to ESA. Uh, on that point, I'm happy to hand back over to, to Neve, or we can go to the, the next you. breakout section. Thanks, Aidan. It's you really do have a fascinating career. Like I visited you at the at the Astronaut Centre, and like you're just trying to re, you're trying to invent things, you know, that 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 don't yet exist, you know. Um, in terms of your secondary school, what what um what subjects do you think that you um that you took that were useful for your career now? Because you know, thinking of the of the students listening today, they're probably thinking about mm, what do I have to study or whatever. So what, what were the what were the subjects that stood to you well now? So the ones that really stood well to me were um, things like, uh, so obviously science uh, and, um, subjects. So I, I did physics for my leaving cert. Yeah. Uh, I also did technical drawing for my leaving cert. Uh, I think it might have changed name now. I'm not sure what it's called anymore. Um, so these were the, the two kind of technical things I did. Um, they really helped me understand a lot more about what goes into science and engineering. Um, but also other skills, mathematics. Uh, I'm not a great mathematician, but maths uh, can be very useful and very helpful. Um, and also um, English, um, um, being able to coherently uh, explain what you're doing and why you're doing it um, is, is a very valuable skill and it's something that a lot of people don't pick up. Um, so having a, a good understanding of how to you know, compose a narrative in, in with essay writing in, less, in, in English uh, is, is a very valuable skill. Yeah. yeah um, what's the best thing about your job? Like I, I think you do really exciting things. So we're off the top of your head. What's what's the best thing that you do, do you think? I guess the, the great thing about my job is that uh, we deal with so many unknowns. So we get given a challenge. We get asked, you know, what can you do with this material here on the lunar surface? And, um, you know, it's, it's like an open question. Uh, and, and this can drive so many different areas of research. 
you know, we can look into extracting uh, oxygen from it, for example. We can maybe look into building something with it. Um, it becomes, and then the question is, okay, how, how do you do this? How do you actually break down that problem? That's a huge problem. Um, you have to start taking small steps at it. Uh, and this is, this is one of the most exciting things about it. Every day, it's something new, some new challenge. A new problem comes up, you have to figure out a new way around it. So it's constantly troubleshooting, constantly problem solving. But every time we do it, we're making advances. Even when we fail, we learn from that. Uh, and this is a, a really great uh, um, motivator. Uh, every day is something different. Every day is a challenge. Every day is not a success, but you still manage to push yourself forward a little bit more. And that's um, deeply motivating. It's fantastic. Aidan, when you were doing the Leeds Insurance, did you think for a second that you'd ever have a career at ESA? No, I didn't. Um, I, I genuinely thought for a long time, I, I, didn't, I could not see a career route for somebody in Ireland to work for something like ESA. I, I only had a vaguest knowledge of what ESA was in that stage. Uh, it wasn't clear to me. I thought you had to be some you know, insanely uh, gifted, um, you know, yeah. uh, Einstein level intellect to, to, to work at, at ESA. Um, the, the reality is um, there are very clever people working at the agency, of course, um, but uh, um, the, there was no clear path for me at that stage in my life uh, to where I ended up now. Um, and that's okay. Um, I think it was only through uh, going through my education that I started to realize that actually what I'm doing now in university can actually be something that could be applied to ESA. It was only later in my career that I actually started to realize, actually, I could actually apply for ESA and maybe get in there, you know? Yeah, it's important, isn't it, to keep your your dream or your, your desire or your passions alive because you, there's many routes to fulfilling them and 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 I think you just always had it in your brain that you know space was important and there you go look where you are it's yeah. amazing yeah. Yeah. so exactly. thanks yeah. thanks for sharing your, your story with us Aiden and for your time so um we're you now have an opportunity some of you to um ask some more questions of Aiden in the breakout room and, and Rob is going to uh, go in with you now and uh, and keep track of that as well so thanks very much for that Aiden we, we'll I'll be talking to you again later on at the end don't forget there is a prize for the best question and so keep those questions coming um and now let's talk to Laura Laura how are you and where are you right now Great. Hey. Um, yes. So I'm Laura, and I am in Leiden. So I work at the at Estec site for ESA, yeah. um, which is in Nordvike. So Leiden's kind of the closest kind of big town that you can, um, where most people live in, I guess, if, if you work there. Um, so it's great to be yeah. here today. Um, and uh, and how long have you have you, have you you've just recently joined um, Estec, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. So I only joined Brilliant. at the first of October. So I'm only my second month now. Um, everything's going great so far. It's uh, super exciting to be part of ESA. Um, and yeah, I'm yeah. loving it. It's great. great. So will you tell us a little bit about your career story then? Absolutely. Let me see if I can share my screen. Um, Thanks, Laura. I can see that fine. That's all coming through. Cool. Um, let's see. Is that all okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks, Neve. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about today about kind of my own career um, and how I kind of ended up today now in ESA. So I am a solar physicist. Um, and what that means is, is I'm an astrophysicist that really focuses on the sun. Um, and so I'm going to talk about today is a little bit of an introduction to why we care about looking at the sun, why is it an interesting um, object in, in an astrophysical term to look at and also from a practical term so we need to think in terms of space weather and this is really important actually when we're thinking about people going to space or people going to the moon um, or even to Mars we need to really consider how you know the active sun is going to influence that so I'll give you an introduction about that then I'm going to talk about you know what what does it mean to be a solar physicist what do I actually do and then I'm going to finish kind of with you know how I got here from school going through college going through kind of where I was I guess before ESA so just to begin, you know, what is a solar physicist again? What do we do? You know, I really love the sun. This is a picture that someone made of, for me when I finished my PhD. Um, or maybe I just don't stop talking about the sun. But this is actually um, a real image of the sun, not with me in it, um, an extreme ultraviolet wavelength. So this is where we see the atmosphere of the sun and it's really, really complicated. So just to kind of start off, this is an actual image of the sun in visible white light. So this is you know, if you had a telescope today with a solar filter on it and you looked at the sun, it's actually, you know, the weather was nice. You might see something that looks like this. Um, it doesn't look too exciting. It's a yellow ball in the sky. You know, you might see these little black dots. Um, these are called sunspots. Uh, you may have heard of them before. And these are regions of really, really intense magnetic activity. 
So again, yeah, the sun doesn't look super interesting in visible light. So you might say, why would you even bother studying it? The interesting part is really when you go into the atmosphere of the sun. So this is a picture, an actual image taken with uh, NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory um, of an image of the sun in extreme ultraviolet wavelength. So this is looking at millions of degrees Celsius of the sun. And we can see it's really, really dynamic. So this is the atmosphere of the sun or the solar corona. Um, and a very, you know, the sun isn't also static. So this is a movie now. Hopefully this is playing. And we can see this massive eruption of one portion of the sun. And even if we look at different regions, we can see this activity going on. It's continuously moving. It's a really hot ball of plasma that's essentially ejecting things out into space continuously. And if we zoom out a little bit and block out the main light from the sun, this is with the coronagraph with SOHO instrument, uh, ESA SOHO instrument, we can see that the sun is completely ejecting all of this hot plasma. You know, and we are orbiting this giant farting sun, essentially. So we really want to understand, you know, the activity of the sun and how it's going to um, eject into space and then how it really impacts the near Earth environment. And this is something we really need to consider moving forward as a technologically advanced society. So I guess just the takeaway here is that the sun is a really kind of quite an active star. Um, and it is continuously in motion and flux and, and ejecting these uh, coronal mass ejections and solar flares. This is a nice artist impression I find of showing one of these eruptions and how it kind of impacts interplanetary space. So this is Earth. Luckily, we have a nice strong magnetic field that protects us from a lot of these um, energetic particles and eruptions from the sun. Um, we also interact with other planets. So things like, um, you know, Mars, for example, is going to be impacted. It doesn't have as strong as a magnetic field, so it isn't as protected from the sun. So in this way, we want to understand, you know, how the sun influences the near Earth environment and the interplanetary space environment, particularly for things like astronauts in space. And, you know, the sun for a long time, we've known it to have a large influence on Earth. Um, one such example is, is the Northern Lights or the Aurora Borealis. So we see, when we see these green and red colors in the, in, when you go kind of a higher latitudes, this is actually in, like highly energetic particles from the sun that are coming in through kind of magnetic field lines that come in towards Earth and interacting with our atmosphere only around 100 kilometers up. So it's actually quite, you know, it's coming quite far down if you think about it, these are actual highly energetic particles from the sun. So this is a nice kind of uh, cartoon here showing, you know, how the protective layer of the Earth's magnetic field really is. So the Northern Lights is maybe one of the prettier sides of, of you know, the influence we have on the sun, but it can also have severe adverse space weather effects, you know? so. I mean, really, only in the past hundred years, we are becoming more and more dependent on our technology and our telecommunications. And these things are highly susceptible to, you know, energetic particles that are coming from the sun and these eruptions from the sun. Um, one such example is our, our, our satellites in space. They don't have as much protection uh, of the magnetic field. You can have energetic particles that interact with the detectors on board or um, and things on board which can kind of disrupt them. It can also increase atmospheric drag. So, you know, you're causing your, your satellite to kind of come closer towards Earth. Um, in terms of astronauts in space, as I mentioned, again, even at the ISS, they don't have as much protection as we have here on the ground um, for energetic particle events and CMEs, these coronal mass ejections. Um, and this is particularly important when you go to the moon, when you don't have a magnetic field, you don't have this protective shield. So people are really thinking now of smart ways to protect our astronauts in space. And particularly when going to Mars, if you think about it, you're going to be in a spacecraft for six months. How are you going to be able to be protected from these space weather events? Um, so in this way, what we want to do is we want to understand these eruptions, um, both from kind of a plasma physics interesting point of view to try to understand the physics behind it, but also from a forecasting point of view. Can we forecast when these eruptions are going to occur and essentially have a really high quality space weather forecast? So similar way, you might say, oh, there's a hurricane coming here on Earth in a particular point. We can say there's going to be a large eruption from the sun going in this direction. We need to put up our shields. We need to prepare for, for these uh, events. So this is kind of, you know, the motivation behind what I do and why we care about the sun. And why I think it's interesting is you have that, you know, the sun is a star. It has this interesting astronomical point of view, but also it has a practical point of view. We want to understand the sun more so we can build better forecasts and understand kind of the influence it has here on Earth and in the near Earth environment. So how do we observe the sun? So we can observe it, you know, the sun emits in, in lots of different wavelengths from ground-based observatories. And um, we can look at it in visible light and in radio waves. So 
This is a, a picture of the ILOFAR, the Low Frequency Array Station in Burr County, Offaly, that many of you may have heard of before. Um, so, you know, really, again, just highlights Ireland really is at the forefront of doing uh, astronomical research and doing um, solar research. The great thing about radio waves is it doesn't matter if it's cloudy, you can still see the sun. Um, and then the Swedish Solar Telescope and the proposed European Solar Telescope um, takes these beautiful images of the sun. So this is an actual image of a sunspot. Um, so again, just to highlight the, the, the kind of um, research that is going on in Europe and in Ireland, uh, looking at these, um, looking at, at space and the sun. But when we go to space, we kind of don't have you know, the atmosphere blocks out lots of light when we go to space we can see all the light from the sun and this is just just a snapshot of all the different instruments currently looking at the sun and kind of influence on earth uh, and what i want to highlight is ESA's solar orbiter which was launched in february 2020 so february last year um which i'm currently working on and this is super exciting this is looking at the sun with lots of different ways both with in situ measurements, so it's actually taking measurements of the electrons and things coming from the sun, and also taking lots of images of the sun, and it's going to go really, really close and out of the ecliptic plane. So it's a really exciting time, and it's going to teach us a lot about um, kind of all those things I talked about. So then to give that was a bit of an introduction, but what do I do? What does a solar physicist actually do? We do look at pretty pictures of the sun, but in particular, I focus on these big eruptions. And I do this by using both space and ground-based observations. So we use observations from those satellites that are taking images of the sun and kind of ground-based instruments like LOFAR that are taking radio images and radio spectra of the sun, try to get a better understanding of all the different physical components that build up to be these solar flares. So on a day-to-day -day basis, what does, or I guess one of the things I love about this is that it kind of combines lots of different elements of STEM. You know, you have physics, you have plasma physics, the sun is a big ball of plasma. You have astrophysics, you know, the sun is a star. So, you know, what can we learn about the sun that will help us to understand other stars, um, other stars similar to our sun and other stars, you know, that might be older or younger than our sun or a different spectral type completely. We also need to do a lot of maths to understand, you know, coordinate systems, statistics, all of these different types of maths that goes in behind the physics of the plasma physics and the astrophysics. Um, coding is a huge element of what I do. So we need to do, you know, analyze the data. So we need to be able to write computer programs to process the data, to plot the data, to analyze that data. And similarly enough, sometimes I say that I'm a glorified data scientist. And um, so data science is a hot topic right now. And essentially what I do is, you know, you're taking this data and you're doing different data science techniques, such as machine learning and artificial intelligence to try to get the most of your data, to try to get the physics out of it. Uh, and then similarly, software engineering. So you need to be able to, you know, write good software that's reproducible for science. Um, and I think this is what's interesting about being a solar physicist and an astrophysicist is that it really combines all those different aspects of STEM, which I personally really, really love. Um, so a typical day would be, you know, you get your data from your satellite, you might process it, you start to analyze it, you look at plots, you make those plots, then you think about it and you try to compare it to a physical model to try to better understand, you know, what can we build upon? What can this help us towards building better forecasts, predicting when these are gonna occur? What is the physics going on? There's lots of still unanswered questions, particularly about uh, the sun and its dynamics. And then what's really interesting is also, you're not just thinking about what data we have now, you're thinking about the future. What are the future missions? What can we have? right now and the data we use right now and how can that inform us to build the new instruments, the new generation of observatories that are going to go to space and observe the sun. Um, and I really think that's that's one of the really nice aspects too I really like about um, my job. So I guess that's kind of a again just a snapshot of solar physics and what a solar physicist does, but you know how did I end up here? Um, so this is a bit of a timeline of my career and, and what I kind of did before now I'm at, I'm at ESA as a research fellow. Um, so I did my Leaving Cert in Loretta Secondary School in Bray, um, and then I went to Trinity College Dublin, I did an undergraduate degree in theoretical physics, then I did a PhD in astrophysics, then I went to work at NASA for two years, and now I'm here. But I'm going to step through each of those um, portions and kind of talk a little bit more in detail. And just to kind of start off, I had no plans to become an astrophysicist or a solar physicist or never thought I'd be working at ESA. Um, I guess just to, to give a snapshot, you know, when I was in school doing my leaving cert, uh, the subjects I chose for doing my leaving cert were physics, chemistry, applied maths and art. And the physics and chemistry side was I always loved science and, you know, even physics for the leaving junior cert at the time wasn't that exciting. But in TY, we did some cool talks and I was like, well, maybe the leaving cert physics might be a bit more interesting. And I, 
luckily I was I was right. So in school, my favorite subjects were always maths and um, maths and physics. So I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I was in school, but I didn't knew that I loved maths and physics. So I was like, maybe I, I also loved art. So I really didn't have any idea. So I went to uh, Trinity College Dublin had an open day in the School of Physics and I actually met someone who was doing their undergraduate degree in theoretical physics and they basically said to me you know you love physics and maths theoretical physics is the course for you and I said great that's what I'll do um, and at the time I just read Stephen Hawking's brief history of time and I was like great I'll be a theoretical physicist and I'll solve all the string theory problems of the world so then I went to Trinity College Dublin and I got the points luckily and I got in and basically what this course is, is you basically only do physics and maths. So it's kind of a, a course between the School of Physics and the School of Maths in Trinity. Um, and I really like that, you know, you kind of, they were my two favourite subjects, so I was in my element, I guess. Um, and during university, a lot of times in the summer, you have a lot of time off, you can do some internships. So I ended up doing, after my second year, uh, an internship in the School of Maths in Lattice Quantum Chromodynamics. And, you know, it got a bit too theoretical for me. I was like, I don't think I want to do this as a career. I don't think I'm actually too keen on theoretical physics. Um, so I'm back into my third year and I was actually quite involved in the physics society. So there's lots of societies in the university. And I met some kind of cool professors. They were giving outreach talks and things like that. And one of the professors, Peter Gallagher um, at Trinity, he works in the sun. So I got talking to him and I ended up going to NASA to do an internship after my third year of my undergraduate degree. Um, and this is something completely different. It wasn't theoretical physics. It was to do observations of the sun and to look at these extreme ultraviolet waves that we see propagate on the sun. And um, so I spent three months um, over in Maryland at NASA Goddard, and I kind of fell in love with that aspect of, of research, you know, doing practical research. And um, you're kind of combining maths, physics, uh, data science, uh, computer vision to work on this. So I loved that so much, I decided I didn't want to leave college. Um, and I ended up doing a PhD. So a PhD is essentially another kind of thing you do after your undergraduate degree. It's for four years, typically. And I focused on looking at X-ray emission from the sun. Um, and this was funded. So a PhD is typically funded. So you get paid to, to do it. You get a, a stipend. And uh, it was funded by the Irish Research Council and also co-funded by NASA, the NASA RESI mission. So that was great. So during the time I could spend, you know, three months of the year over back in, in NASA and um, Goddard in Maryland. Um, and then also I got this opportunity to work at the NASA Frontier Development Lab in my last year of my PhD. And what this was is essentially um, an applied accelerator public-private partnership. So you may have heard of artificial intelligence and machine learning. This is really advanced in places like Google, you know, anything on your phone, you get recommender systems. It's all artificial intelligence. But we also have a lot of data from space. So the, this idea was to kind of combine both, you know, the advances made in the industry to apply it to solar physics and astrophysics data. Um, so I worked on this team um, where we tried to predict GPS disruptions caused by space weather. So kind of going back to the idea of like how the sun influences um, the earth and can we build a prediction of forecast using kind of um, artificial intelligence. And we actually could, which was super cool. We got to use this advanced supercomputing facility at NASA and also with partners at IBM, particularly we were able to use their facilities to kind of you know, use your massive computers to, to do this work, which is fantastic. And then when I finished um, my PhD, I had a nice connection at Goddard. So I went back and I did, um, I worked for two years as part of this postdoctoral program. And I continued to work on solar flares. Um, I particularly worked on the RESI mission, which was a NASA X-ray mission looking at the sun. Um, and it was here I got really, again, involved in new missions and collaboration. So how do we plan for the next generation um, of missions um, and things going on um, in space and collaboration, both with ESA and in NASA. So I finished up there. Um, earlier this year, and I've now joined ESA. And it's a really exciting time to be in ESA as a solar physicist, because as I mentioned, um, Solar Orbiter has been recently launched last year. So I was actually at the launch in Cape Canaveral, because um, I was in the US at the time, so I was able to fly down. So it's really exciting to be able to say that I saw a launch, and now I'm actually working with the data. Um, so building on from RESI, which I used at NASA, STIX is the X-ray instrument on Solar Orbiter. And this is essentially a legacy, it, the next generation of X-ray instruments. It builds a lot of legacy from RESI, so it's nice to have that, that kind of connection. And there's a huge Irish input, particularly into STIX. Um, a lot of the co-investigators on the STIX team are actually Irish, which is really cool. Um, and also it's exciting. So Solar Orbiter is actually coming very close to Earth now, and it's going to um, go back towards the sun and the nominal mission phase is starting now. So basically next week, we're gonna be in the nominal mission phase of, of Solar Orbiter. So I think I'm running short on time, but here's just um, 
the orbit of Solar Orbiter. Um, so you can see it was launched last year. Um, so right now is the start of its nominal phase and it's going to go close to the sun. It's going to go super close. It's going to go in 0.3 AU. So in closer than, than Mercury is, which is super exciting and something we've never been able to do before and actually take images of the sun. Um, and just to kind of show you, you know, this mission is going to last for many, many years. So if you end up going to university and you do astrophysics, it could be very more than likely that you might actually work on data um, from Solar Orbiter. So it's going to really answer some of the big questions about the sun and give us some really new insights about, you know, what's going on about the, the, the polar regions that we're going to be able to see close to the top of the sun, which we've never been able to see before. It's going to tell us a lot about the solar wind and these eruptions that we see from the sun. It's going to really help us with space weather and really answer some of those questions and help us build on building better forecasts moving forward um, as we live with this large active uh, star. So just to conclude, um, I think it's a really exciting time to be in astrophysics or in solar physics. There's lots of new missions um, and observatories now taking data or in the near future will be taking data both from the ground and from space. I think we need the next generations of scientists. We're kind of have all this new data and all this new technology. We need new scientists to come up, especially European scientists. We have a huge um, influence in the field. And I think if a takeaway I have is, you know, if you follow what you're interested in, I think this is kind of what Aidan said too, you will always do well, right? I mean, just if you work on what you're passionate about, it, it will lead you to kind of something that you're interested in. Um, and it really, don't, you don't need to go and do astrophysics. You can do lots of different subjects, STEM subjects and skill and end up in the space industry. Um, and there, something, again, I had no idea when I was probably your age that there were opportunities to work in space, uh, both at NASA and particularly at ESA. Um, so there's lots of opportunities um, in the space industry um, from Ireland. So that's all I have to say. I hope I wasn't over time. That's um, great, Laura. No, it was terrific. And thank you so much for explaining, you know, what solar physics is and, you know, because it's such a specific area of, of science it's fantastic that you kind of um, helped explain it and you really are in a really exciting um, phase of your career it's, it's fantastic uh, to see you there and um, you know when you were at the leaving cert stage did you think for a second that you were going to end up working at NASA first and then ESA our own space agency did you ever think that you would no absolutely not I think mainly because I was probably just a bit ignorant. I didn't even realize maybe that the times that there were these opportunities. Um, and it was really when I went to, to university when I realized, you know, the foot Ireland has in research, in space, in material yeah. science, you kind of feel, you know, that we don't have these scientists, but we're everywhere. Um, and there are so many opportunities. Yeah. So I just didn't realize. And I think if I had realized back then, I probably would have been more driven to to get into the space industry and we may have done astrophysics, but I just didn't realize at the time that there were those opportunities, um, for sure. Um, any advice that you'd give people then? You know, I, I think Aidan said it, it's the same with me and the same with you. What is it about that phase of our lives that we think we couldn't possibly have that kind of career? How, how do we that people stick to the thing that they're that they're most passionate about? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think if I maybe some advice would be you know I think when you're doing your leaving search and you're trying to choose a subject you feel like what you choose is going to be what you do for the rest of your life and that's just not the case it does it's not the be all and end all about what course you end up doing there are so many different ways as Aidan mentioned to kind of move when you do a STEM subject the one of the great things is if you have those foundations in STEM it's easy to kind of move between the different um, aspects so I would say yeah just follow what you're interested in and the rest will, will kind of come um, lovely Great and, uh, and and such fascinating research that you're doing as well and, and the very best of luck with that. So so now you get a chance to ask Laura your own questions. I mean, I could ask all day of her questions, but it's your it's your session. It's your time. So um, so now you're going to get a chance to move uh, with Laura into the breakout room. Some of you um, again, don't forget that there is a prize for best question and Rob is in there keeping track of everything and helping you uh, have the courage to ask her all the questions you're, you, you think you, you have to know. So thanks again, Laura. And we'll talk to you at the end then for the, for the big uh, Q&A session at the end. So that was Laura Hayes and she is a research value at ESA STEC. So, so um, for those of you lucky enough to join her in the breakout room, take every advantage and ask her every question you can possibly think of. So now we move on to our third uh, uh, contributor this morning, uh, Lawrence O'Rourke. And Lawrence, where are you talking to us from this morning? Good morning. It's, uh, can you hear me okay? 
Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Morning, perfect. Um, so I, I'm I'm talking to you from Madrid, sunny Madrid. Although it's cloudy, Madrid. it's cloudy today. Mm -hmm. But um, so I'm I'm from the uh, well, I'm working in the European Space Astronomy Centre, which is one of the establishments of ESA, and we're based uh, just on the northwest of Madrid. So I'm in the office at the moment. Fantastic, fantastic. So so will you please tell us about your career? Because I sure, I know it's sure, really sure. Interesting. Yeah. I've heard. Uh, yeah, please. So I'll, I'll share now, and uh, um, let's okay. jump straight into it. So let me know if you can see my slides. I can see your slides. Yeah, I can see them loud and clear. Okay, Thanks, Lawrence. Okay, good. So, um, okay, so I, I'm my, my slides. I'm going to be um, uh, giving a, an overview. It's a very different, maybe different talk to the way it was done by by Aiden and by by Laura. But certainly, the, the intention is to give you an idea by background uh, where what I've done and uh, where uh, what I've been. Um, where, where I come from and, and effectively in some ways where I'm going. So let's just uh, jump straight in with the, the first slide. So basically I, I uh, did my leave insert in um, Garberley College in Ballinasloe, uh, which is boarding school. So I was boarded there for a number of years. Um, and uh, being a boarder, I guess, gives you a lot of independence and it's something you learn over time that when you're away for a long time, you do get a lot of independence. And that's very important, I guess, when it comes to traveling. Um, so I did, um, I did uh, my leaving cert, um, and I'm just showing you some examples of so the, the subjects I did. And I did tech drawing, accountancy, biology, and French. And, and this is a great mix of subjects. Basically, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And so what you do is you keep, keep the options open. Maybe I want to do uh, engineering of some sort with drawing or tech draw of some sort. Maybe I want to go into business. Uh, well, or maybe I want to do science, and, or, or indeed, maybe I want to get into linguistics of some sort. And um, the reality was I had no idea what I wanted to do after, after um, the leaving cert. And so this is why, in some ways, the, uh, the subjects were so vague. And, and even when I got the leaving cert, I still wasn't sure. But of course, you got to choose from the CAO. You got to choose some, some uh, different courses. And I chose business, for example, and I chose science. And, and uh, science I chose in, in, in middle college, for example, on the basis that uh, I wanted to keep it general because I still had no idea what I wanted to do. So by keeping it somewhat general, uh, you get into the area and then maybe you find what you what what really uh, um, what rocks your boat. I think is the best way to put it. So the um, I, I got um, well, to to let you know I got two honors in my leaving cert. Uh, but in those days, I guess the just the points uh, were were, um, were were everything's lower in those days. But maybe maybe the exams were harder. But I'm not even going to get into that. I think we all have to uh, suffer when we do leaving cert. But I did. Um, I went and got a science degree. Well, went to University College in, in Minut, and uh, and there um, there I, I joined the first year, and there I had the first four subjects of science, whether it's biology, chemistry. Uh, maths and physics, uh, very STEM-based in some way, at least from the science perspective. And um, uh, and what I came out with from Manute was, in fact, a double honours degree. Uh, and those is really a double honours. So it was an honours degree in physics and an honours degree in mathematics. And so I highlight physics here because, as you'll see, physics was what I came out with an honours degree with, and yet physics I didn't do in my leaving cert. And so in some ways, what I'm trying to show is that you can come, you can, in, in, when you're in school, you're trying to make decisions. You're trying to figure out where, where to want to go. And it's often a situation that you don't, you don't know where, where, your, where your aptitude is. And it's often in university that you find that you have this uh, certain aptitude or you find you don't and you want to change area. And it's important to recognize that it's never too late to change an area and to do, learn other things. So when I finished with an honors degree, this uh, degree in minutes, I then... Um, uh, it's still very vague. I mean, physics is such a huge area. Maths is such a huge area. But at least I had an idea now at this point what I was interested in, which is more the microeconomics aspects. And so I went and did a master's in engineering science, which is interesting. It's engineering science, um, uh, which is what I am at the moment, an engineer and a scientist. But I did the microeconomics, which is based in, in University College Cork um, in the Tyndale Institute. In fact, it's called at that time NMRC. And uh, just to show you a little bit, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of what you what, what I built. I mean, you 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 build a silicon chip. You know, uh, with uh, with all of the layers that make up. What you learn about the micro the microprocessor. You learn all about how the silicon chips are made, and you um uh, you learn how to connect them to the with, with the, to the circuit board. Of course, you got from wires to connect them. And and my my masters was all about trying to uh, place a capacitor on top of of the silicon chip. And so uh, okay, I I achieved it. I got my masters, and um. From there, because of my background there for microelectronics and packaging of these uh, these uh, units, let's say, or digital uh, silicon chips, I um, 
I, I was offered, uh, well, I applied for the young graduate traineeship in the Urban Space Agency. Now, the YGT is a very, uh, a young graduate trainee is one of the uh, programs that you can you can enter or at least apply for every year if you've got a master's to get into ESA. And I applied and because of my microelectronics background and of course, microelectronics for space applications is very big. Well, I got in. But what I'm going to do now in the next two slides is just give you my space career in a nutshell. And then I'm going to go into details afterwards. So basically, I went to uh, the European Space Technology Center in Aztec. That's where I did my young graduate traineeship. I was there for about two years. Uh, then I moved to, to Germany, the European Space Operations Center in Germany. I was there for about six years. And then finally, I moved to, to Spain and Madrid, the European Space Astronomy Center. And and, uh, and maybe to point out that someday your education doesn't end. You finish university. It doesn't mean that you, you finish learning. It, it's all learning. You keep learning throughout your career. And, I, and especially you'll notice I didn't have any background really in space applications. And so one of the first um, courses which I did when I was in ESTEC in the technology center as a young graduate was a spacecraft system engineering course. And uh, if you have no knowledge of space, but you really are interested in, in, in uh, finding out more about what area maybe but would you're interested in moving into the space field, well, this is an ideal course to do. So I'd I certainly recommend it. You might be a mechanical engineer in the future. You might be an engineer of, or a scientist. But uh, a course like this, even if it's three days, will give you, let's say, open uh, your eyes to what, what options are there. But of course, I've seen Aidan, for example, and Laura have already mentioned some careers, which I think are very interesting. Now, in ESA, I'm in ESA about 20 years, which makes me quite old, I guess. But um, uh, I've been working on six different missions, uh, on, and each one has, has been challenging, has had its own, uh, let's say, impact on my career, the, the things I've learned. And I'm going to now go into details and explain a little bit what are the, the type of things that I've been doing in each of these missions, but also to, under, to help you understand more about uh, the type of uh, careers you can have when you're working in the space field. So let's let's look at this now, at least uh, looking at each of the missions and, and what happened. So I mentioned I was a young graduate trainee in ESTEC, and uh, you can see pictures of me younger, uh, but that's the way it goes. But um, there's a picture at the top left, which shows um, what looks like an explosion. And this was, in fact, when I was in, in ESTEC in 1996, the first Ariane 5 rocket, which is one of ESA's rockets, it blew up with uh, four satellites on top of it, the cluster spacecraft. It was the first launch. It was a very unfortunate, uh, uh, well, a major mistake, basically. But uh, but um, why I show this picture is because uh, because of the concern of launching another satellite on this rocket, which was now unproved. Um, the young graduate trainees we offered to build a satellite for the next launch for Ariane 502. And so, in this respect, I got I moved from being working in microelectronics engineering. I I just done the space system engineering course, and I said, okay, well, I'm interested in you know, maybe wiring the spacecraft, et cetera. And so this is what you see in the end, um, in the undergraduate traineeship and for the year afterwards, I was working on, on the integration and tests, assembly integration and tests, putting together a satellite, the wiring, uh, how it all works, and then looking at the integrating it and testing it. This is one area, it's called AIT, it can often be called AIV, but it's a mix of spacecraft, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. I'm just pointing there, there's, we, on the, the satellite we built called TeamSat, or it even, we put all our names uh, inscribed on the side. And so I'm just pointing my name at you, which it's a pity, it's like a terrible picture because I could never see my name in this picture. But uh, I assume it's there, uh, but it's floating in space now, it'll be there for a few hundred years. And this on the right hand side is just the, uh, the, the joy of being able to travel to the launch site and actually uh, standing beside a rocket, which is going to lo launch your satellite. It doesn't happen often, but very, very cool. Um, I then moved to, to Germany, to ESOC. And in ESOC is where, so I built a satellite. And uh, satellites, when they're built, when they're placed on top of the rocket, they're put into space. And then you move from spacecraft engineering, building the satellites, to operations engineering. And the operations engineering is all about what do you do with the satellite when it's in space? It separates from the rocket. But you also have the part of this called ground segment engineering. Ground segment is, so you've got space segment is a satellite in space. The ground segment is everything on ground, which is, is involved in controlling that satellite, communicating with that satellite, retrieving the data from that satellite and processing and producing scientific, let's say, output or engineering output. And so as part of this, I was for a number of years working on the Envisat satellite, which was the biggest uh, environmental satellite that, well, it's, it, that has ever been launched, still up in space now. And um, one of the things I was doing was to, to test um, the, the ground stations. It was when it separated from the rocket, um, then it was going so fast that you needed to have, it was flying around the earth. And so you need to capture the signal and you got nine minutes to get some data. And then the next satellite ground station has to be there. And so 
testing this was just part of the work I did for for um, Envisat. And then um, towards the end of that, I was I got involved with the operations engineer aspects, which is of course now you're you're looking a bit more at, uh, at commanding the spacecraft, etc. And just picture an old picture. Basically, uh, the great thing about a picture of being in the center is that it's very easy just to put a box around myself and you can see me there sitting there. So this was where I was involved with in the operations and controlling the satellite after it separated from the rocket. Um, when I finished in Envisat, I moved on to Rosetta. And Rosetta was a satellite which was launched in 2004, traveled 10 years, arrived to rendezvous in orbit at Comet. And uh, so I was on ground when I was, I was in ESOC, but basically having some experience on how a satellite is built, well, they sent me to ESTEC for a while also to, to aid in, its, in testing the satellite uh, on ground, uh, testing the, the, uh, that everything was working, preparing it for operations. And so this is what I did a little bit for a while was uh, the images of what was just sitting in front of the satellite uh, and beside the high gain antenna, which is 2.2 meter dish, which was how we communicated with the satellite. Well, when the satellite separated from the rocket, uh, again, I was on the flight control team, it's called, the team which is controlling uh, the, the spacecraft after operations and, well, as part of operations. And so, again, you see me a bit in the, at the bottom. This is our night shift where we're handing over a, a team handover, just uh, getting a picture from the webcam. Um, I, then after, so Rosetta launched, I was involved a bit in the flight and the operations after launch. And then I moved to Spain, which is where I am now, uh, the European Space Astronomy Center. And here in Spain, we do what's called science, uh, science operations. Science operations is different, let's say, to the spacecraft operations in that a spacecraft, and especially a science spacecraft, is built with a, with a certain purpose, a scientific purpose. And the purpose is that you've got instruments on board, which are there to either look at the Earth or you're looking at, say, looking at um, uh, objects in space, whether it's asteroids, whether it's comets, or whether you're looking at the sun, or uh, whether you're looking at, uh, at, uh, um, at the galaxies. All of this is very, very, uh, very interesting. But of course, how do you operate and how do you plan these instruments? Uh, this is all about science operations. It's about uh, putting together the, the timeline of how you're going to use a satellite, where you're going to point it, how you're going to use these instruments, how you're going to get the data down, how you're going to process the data. And so I worked on this gamma ray telescope for a while called Integral. It's still operating after many, many years. I think it's really about 15 years up there. And um, it, it's, it's an interesting satellite in that it's now even being used for helping with the gravitational wave uh, analysis, et cetera, as part of uh, this LEO program. Um, and just pictures there just to show you, you know, you, you participate in teams and then uh, moved over to Herschel. And Herschel is, is, is a bit like a thermos flask, okay? It's a thermos flask, it's a container full of helium, liquid helium. It brings, you put three instruments into this liquid helium, you cool them down to minus 270 degrees Celsius. And it's like anything. When you're that cool, you'll feel anything warmer than that. And what that means is that the, the Earth space, which is full of dust, in fact, you wouldn't see, you wouldn't expect it, but it is a lot of dust there. Dust has a certain temperature. And so with this, you, because it's warmer, dust is warmer than your satellite, then you're gonna see this dust. You can see different temperature variations. And this is this image that you see behind the satellite on the, on the, on the right hand side is just a dust clouds observed with the different temperatures. And so I worked on this for a number of years, putting together the, the prepare, preparing the science operations center for operations. And I was, a, I was a deputy science operations manager for this mission with a big team. And uh, we had a lot of fun with this one. And finally, then after Herschel, uh, I moved back to Rosetta. Okay, so Rosetta had flown for nearly 10 years. It was ready to, to orbit this comet. Um, and so having worked on it previously, well, then they asked me to, to join again. And so I was putting, again, working on science operations, just uh, probably the most difficult satellite I've ever worked on when it comes to science operations, because it had, it had um, 14 instruments and each one uh, has its priority and everybody wants to look at different things. And so it's trying to put together a, a planning or a timeline for how to orbit this satellite, get everything, there, get, get, do everything they want to do and get the data down was was quite uh, well, was was a challenge to say the least. So I'm showing this uh, this image. This is just the comet rotating, and every time, and you see all these little white lines sticking up. And this uh, what this is just uh, it's explosions from the surface, and these explosions are just uh, the white represents dust dust that's been released with the gas from the from the surface. And I just show you this because you know the benefits I guess of working in space over time is you get small prizes which you always enjoy. I mean, this one here is, is we collected the dust with instruments on the, on the spacecraft and, and I got my own piece of dust floating in space now with my own name. Um, uh, it'll be there for, for 
billions of years, who knows? But at least, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, I've got a dust <laughs> dust particle named after me. I'm trying to figure out the benefit, whether it's a good thing or not. <laughs> okay, but anyway, what you're looking at here is is just to give you an idea of of the scale of this thing. It's uh, it's about four kilometers. It's as if it's just uh, falsely uh, standing on top of Los Angeles, probably crushing a lot of Hollywood actors. Um, but it's a four kilometer beast of of an object which we were flying around, and we had to actually land. On the surface of it and i just show you this picture because an interesting one it had like a, a very large cliff uh on one one of the surface of one of the uh, uh the two uh parts of the of the comet and it, the comet the, the 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 height of this cliff was 900 meters which you know how do you give the scale well the best way to do it is throw the uh, cliffs of moher in there and that's just to give you an idea of the height of these cliffs on this comet and basically what you're talking about is is, is a surface which is extremely dangerous and what you want to do and this is where i got involved was to land a lander on the surface of this comet and so they asked me to to take over and to become the uh, the ESA lander system engineer for um, for for affiliate lander and so i show on this picture with highlighted in, in yellow just at the time when i was working on Rosetta before it launched on the integration testing. This is the lander behind me. And so I had some experience. And so they, they asked me to join again just to help with uh, preparing it for launch, sorry, for landing on the surface. I was there for the for landing itself, um, which has its own uh, uh, fun. And um, uh, and this is what happened. I mean, you separate the lander, it flies down towards the surface. And it's uh, effectively the mechanisms which were needed to hold it to the surface when it touched down failed, it bounced. And uh, the reality was, although we, we, we managed to get everything we wanted for two or three days, um, it, the batteries finished. And uh, then we were trying to see if we could communicate with it again, but primarily because we'd lost the lander. It was hidden somewhere and we didn't know where it was. Uh, we communicated with it, it was fine, but where was it? And so um, this is just, uh, I was asked to lead the lander system search team, which was, a group of about 20 different scientists, engineers. Uh, so I would have a system engineering background at this point, a spacecraft operations background, spacecraft engineering background. And so knowing this, it, it helps you to actually put together, let's say, to know what you need to, to do searching. And so I led the team and uh, we couldn't find it for quite a while. We were thinking that we might, it might've been taken by some aliens or something, even from Star Wars. But uh, uh, luckily enough, we did get some some idea of where it was located and so the part of the work we did was to come up with a that i was working on was to come up with a test campaign to to um as we're orbiting this this uh, exploding comet uh we wanted to take images of the lander so the lander is the is the is the point the green point in the middle of this circle um we wanted to take images of it uh from every direction the idea being that at a certain point you might get a perfect view of this this lander and this is what actually happened because uh um but I want to show you this. This is we used its stem to the maximum because, of course, you're using lots of different shape model techniques. Um, you're just, you're overlaying images from the from the the comet uh, on top of shape models, trying to see if you know the uh, where whether what you, what you would planned for is what you see. And this is just to give you an idea. And finally, we found the lander. We found this hidden. Uh, we've got a perfect picture of it hidden underneath a cliff. Uh, it really was. Um, uh, I won in a lifetime shot to get in this shot because it was uh, we were at our closest point to the comet, and uh, we had uh, we were finishing with the mission thirty days. So four weeks later, Rosetta mission was finished. The spacecraft was crashed on the comet, and so we got this image just a few weeks before the mission wrapped up. So that was that was an achievement for which I'm 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 very happy with. Um, but I wanted to show you this. It's not only the, the case of finding it, but there was something strange because I was I was involved in studying all the images trying to find, uh, you know, come up with best ways to, sh to visualize it. And when I was studying the images, I saw something very strange with one of the uh, the boulders that was close to where the lander was, about 20 meters away. Uh, it just looked very bright and uh, very difficult to see in this image. But I'll just say that my work on this, so Rosetta land finished in, in um, uh, Rosetta finished in 2016, September 2016, and so I worked on this for a number of years. And what I did in the end was to actually uh, worked out that this bright location, in fact, uh, was uh, had been hit by Philae 
as it's actually on its journey to find its final location. And so when you look at these boulders, effectively this spot in top left right there is where the uh, on the right hand side you then see the, the what looks like a skull. And basically this is the idea is that uh, it was the eye of the skull was made by Philly as it goes through. You can even see a bit of an idea of, of scale there at the bottom, which uh, basically this an astronaut, uh, speaking about astronauts, about, let's say five foot three or so, it's, it's really very big boulders made of comets, uh, dust and ice. But stem to the next one, just to give you an idea again, that's where is the skull face? You've seen the skull face, but where do you find it? Well, you got to effectively, you got to turn everything upside down. And uh, when you turn everything upside down, then you suddenly see it hidden in the darkness. Okay, but let's not forget, I'm a scientist too. So how does science fit into all of this? So you've just seen, I've basically, with all the work I've done, I've managed to find the location where Philly has actually hit the surface uh, just before it finally it went to its final location. And this is where I, I produced a nature paper last year in 2020. Uh, and nature is a very prestigious journal, so it's a bit, very difficult to, to publish there. But what I'd done in the science perspective was to um, link um, uh, the uh, the magnetic magnetometer data, which was a boom sticking out, measuring the magnetic field of the comet, its movement matched with how Philae went across the surface, and I was able to to demonstrate that um, how how Philae passed through this location using my magnetic data, and in fact. Because it's all science, we also use instruments on Rosetta to check the uh, with the, with the visible, visible and infrared uh, images to try to confirm. Well, what was this bright spot you saw in the image? Well, it was water ice, and uh, water ice frozen for billions of years from the formation. We worked out that Philae had actually left its impression on the ice. We worked out how this was the mechanical engineering aspect. We worked out how soft the ice was, and even could conclude that this billions of year old ice was uh, was as soft as the froth on your cappuccino uh, or even uh, on, on the foam on a seashore. So this was the science aspect. You, The science comes into how do you demonstrate that this is water ice? Uh, but I like, uh, you know, we're talking water ice on a comet. I like comets. I like asteroids. This is my science area. And of course, if you look at the uh, the solar system between Mars and Jupiter, you have a major asteroid belt. Uh, then as you go further out, um, you, you hit what's called the Cooper cloud, but in fact, it's known as the Edgeworth Cooper cloud because uh, not many people say this, but Edgeworth, in fact, was from County Westmead. Uh, and he was the first one to identify the Cooper belt. And then Cooper was from Holland and he actually confirmed it afterwards. And so they named him more Cooper and then they updated it for Cooper. But when you go beyond the, the asteroids between Mars and Jupiter, you, go, you hit clouds of comets like the Edgeworth Cooper belt and even the Oort cloud. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in asteroids and comets. And this is just another example of part of my research. We looked at, uh, at an asteroid, which was believed in 2010 would actually hit the Earth in 2030. And so we did some infrared instruments. So we looked at it in the, in the, the far infrared, got an idea of, by observing it, we got actually a better idea of its orbit, confirmed that it's not going to uh, hit the Earth at all. Uh, it's going to go in between, below the orbit of some of the satellites, but at least that was uh, one thing we got. And then another paper I published, Nature paper in 2014, was where we discovered uh, water ice on the surface of the largest asteroid in the solar system. It was the first detection ever of water ice on the surface. So we did that, and all of this led me to have my, my own asteroid being named after me, which was very good of the IAU. And back to the present, because we're nearly done. Uh, this is what I'm working on now, the science operations engineering, back to science. Uh, I'm preparing the, the science operations center here at, say, in Madrid, which will uh, control 25, 26 cameras on the Plato uh, satellite. And the Plato satellite is going to look at a huge area of sky. It's going to measure uh, look at thousands and thousands of stars, going to look to see how as a star passes in front of, of one of the stars, sorry, as a planet that passes in front of one of the stars, how the light dims down. You can actually tell, uh, you can tell the, the, the uh, uh, how the, the, you can tell that basically there's a planet there. You can tell from the, from the, the sun that, that the star, how it moves, you can tell how old it is, and then you can observe it from ground. From this, you can tell how, what type of planet it is. The aim of Plato, which is I'm looking forward to seeing the results, in, is, is really to find Earth's twin. The first time we're going to find really a planet like the Earth at the same distance as uh, to the sun as, as our Earth is. And then last slide, I think, let me just check. Ah, yeah, last one. Sometimes I talked about something, your learning never ends. And only this year. I got, I became a doctor, Lawrence O'Rourke. So I got a PhD in astrophysics from the University Complutense in Madrid. Um, and so this is just something that from my 
earliest stage of never having done physics or uh, just having done biology, in fact, leaving cert to where I am now, which is looking a completely different career. Uh, and even with uh, a doctor in astrophysics, it's been a, a forward ride. It hasn't ended yet, but um, uh, that's my talk and um, looking forward to hearing your questions. Oh, Lord, that's just, you've had such an interesting career, you know, and like, I, I love what you said that you didn't study physics and yet it has kind of dominated your career all the way through and, and science and engineering and so many, so many, you, you, you know, a lot of what you do has been so long term, you know, like from the start of Rosetta and all those different um, satellites, fascinating and there you go, lifelong learning. You're, you, you just got your PhD just this year after all of all the other learning, you know? So you never stop learning, really. Sure you don't. No, not at all. It's, uh, but uh, but I, it's, it's, I guess the big difference is that you're not being examined on it. <laughs> well, I guess a PhD is an exam on it, but uh, yeah. it's not like you have an exam yeah. at the end of the year, which is, of course, something you see in the yeah. school and the yeah. research or whatever. But uh, uh, it's all a learning exercise. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. I mean, all of this is the basis of what, what I've been learning. But you learn it. You learn it not through, not because you're forced to learn, it's because you have an interest. And that's exactly what Laura is saying. I mean, you've got to, it's very important to follow your interests here. And, uh, and just because um, uh, you, the work you're doing, and maybe you choose something in college, uh, just because of what you choose in college, maybe you're not very happy with it or you're unsure how this will lead. Uh, don't forget that it's never, it's just a stepping stone. All of this is a stepping yeah. stone to do other things and uh, yeah. never be afraid yeah. to jump career if you feel it's, it's not the way to go. But most important thing in my view is motivation. You must like what you're doing. Yeah. Only then will you appreciate and enjoy what you're doing and, uh, and you'll learn a lot more. Yeah. Yeah, I hope you get a chance to talk more because I think that's the most confusing thing, I think, when you're at that stage of filling out your CEO form. It's hard to know what you enjoy most because I don't think... We really think about it because we think we're in a system of school and learning in school is very different from what you love and for me it was you know it was delayed and i think maybe um other people today might might feel the same thing so again you now have uh, another 20 minutes to talk to lawrence Good. and in a breakout session keep those questions coming there's some great questions already coming in so keep them coming while you were speaking Lawrence I actually uh, shared Stephanie sent it to me uh, for people who didn't know about the amazing uh, Rosetta mission which kind of took over my life in, in 2014 and, and onwards and uh, there's some beautiful series of animated videos which will tell the story of Rosetta so it'll put it'll put that mission in, in context for, for, for Lawrence so Lawrence if you unshare your screen there that would be great and um, we move on to the next phase and, and thanks again don't forget your questions um, we are keeping track of uh, the best questions for a competition later on and uh, and uh, Rob will now take you uh, into the breakout room with Lawrence for you to continue asking questions thanks again Lawrence so um, while uh, while Lawrence is there um, we're now for those of the groups that are still with us we're now going to hear a little bit more about what Azero Ireland do and some of the opportunities that are available to you right now in your secondary school so Stephanie is going to explain some more detail about that thanks Stephanie thank you Neve gosh that they were really interesting presentations oh, right? amazing Oh my gosh, like all of them. They're doing such such fascinating work. But they all started with just a simple leaving cert and all of them really didn't have a big plan apart exactly. from the fact that they all just loved STEM subjects. So it just they shows you, you know? And I think the, the key is that they, they are all interested in asking questions and finding out stuff, isn't that? Yeah, yeah. that's a curiosity. That's it. Okay, Stephanie, I'll go on mute for a bit and just let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Okay, thanks, uh, Neve. So yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit about what Azero Ireland does, apart from these space careers roadshows, which as I said, we run three times a year. The next one will be for engineers week. So there'll be a focus on engineering at that. So watch the Azero website. Uh, as we all mentioned, uh, Science Week was last week, but there are still loads of events happening um, all around the country still and i'll talk more about some that we're actually doing next week even um uh, if you didn't get a chance to see some of the science week programming on rte um future excuse me um gosh i can't remember the names of them now but you'll get them on the player um and they're really fantastic shows that were were run on um on rte last week for science week 
Um, I also wanted to mention Creating Our Future, and I know Neve uh, mentioned it at the outset, and that's an ongoing initiative being run from the middle of this year right up until March or April next year. It's a government initiative to spark a national conversation on research in Ireland. Um, Science Foundation Ireland, where I work, is one of the partners, and we want you to tell us your idea for what researchers in Ireland should explore to create a better future for us and to make Ireland a best, better place to live. There's a Creating Our Future website, which would be great if you could have a look at that and it'll give you more information about how to get involved. But on the Science Week website, there's a series of uh, toolkits that can be used in your classes. Um, they've been there for a number of weeks in the lead up to Science Week, but they'll remain there. And they're to help you discuss STEM topics in your classes that will affect our future. Uh, uh, there, there was a roadshow, but uh, there's only a small number of places where you can visit that now. So and we won't get too excited about that. But please use the inspiration on the Creating Our, Road, Creating Our Future uh, website to come up with any idea or maybe even help to plan your own event where you can brainstorm and come up with ideas and finally then submit those ideas on the Creating Our Future website. So as I said, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Azero. It's the European Space Education Resource Office. Even I find it difficult to remember exactly what it means. It's a bit of a mouthful. But essentially, it's a network of offices across Europe. Um, and it's, it's um, a project of the European Space Agency Education Office. It was established in 2006. There are currently 18 Azero offices across Europe, and we will have two new more, two more new ones by the end of this year, and two more in, uh, in 2022. Um, Ireland has been a member since 2010, I believe. Uh, I, I have been working in this office since 2012. And there were five Azeros when I joined. So the group really is growing very, very quickly. Um, it's a partnership between the European Space Agency Education Office and a different organization in every country. So in Ireland, the partnership is between ESA Education and Science Foundation Ireland, which is where I work in the Education and Public Engagement Department. So it fits very nicely with what we're trying to do by promoting science, technology and engineering and maths in SFI. Um, and then with my Azero hat on, it's doing the same thing but with a space context. So the Azero objectives are to use space as a context to enhance the literacy and competencies of young people in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths, to try and motivate and help young people and young Europeans to pursue a career in the STEM field, particularly in the space domain. And that's why we run projects like this. And we have a whole career section on the website profiling scientists and engineers that work in the space sector. And we also run, apart from these um, STEM careers roadshows, we have an Azero Space Goes to School program for during Engineers Week, Science Week, and Space Week as well. You can get information on, on that all, all on the, the Azero website. And the Space Goes to School program is where you can actually bring a speaker virtually into your room. So there'll be a panel of speakers available to, to visit your schools virtually. Um, and all that information is on the website. And then the final um, objective of Azero is to increase young people's awareness of the importance of space research, exploration, and the applications from that in modern society and economic uh, economies. So that's what we're trying to do as part of the Azero offices. Some of the things that we do uh, are to promote and to coordinate and to run in Ireland the ESA school projects. You may know about some of these already. Um, these are the, there are five school projects, but the fifth one is only for primary schools. So these are the five school pro four school projects uh, that secondary schools can join in. Uh, CANSAT is a fantastic project where students, senior cycle students, so transition year and up, um, are given an Arduino kit and they have to build a satellite that must sit, fit in the size of a soft drinks can, so a, a Coke can or a 7-Up can or, or whatever. Um, and then um, the, we launch the satellites. 
for regional competitions, the, 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 the satellite must take temperature and pressure data. And then for, for further stages of the competition, uh, students can pick any uh, mission that they like. So they can have any kind of sensors on board that they like. Um, that was launched in September, but you can still join that now. It's still open for joining. We're working with seven institutes of technology on CANSAT. Um, and get you'll get information on that on the Azero website. So if you if you want to join, we'll link you up with your local Institute of Technology uh, or Technological University, um, and they'll do the training for the teams. AstroPi were a little bit late for, for the for the more difficult phase of that, but AstroPi is a programming competition. Um, and students can write their programs and they're run on the um, international the space station. Um, and then you get the, the teams get a, cert, a date stamp certificate from when their program was actually run on the space station. It's using Raspberry Pis um, and there's two Raspberry Pis on the space station. Actually, the, the beginners element is open right up until March of next year. So you can still participate in that. But the more advanced phase uh, that were closed for applications on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Mooncap is another competition. Um, and there, again, there's different elements and different uh, levels to that. Um, and that is using uh, links in with the technology classes. And it's about uh, building a, a, a camp on, on the moon. So using different technology, different platforms to design and, and build a, a moon camp. Climate de Detectives then is the final one I want to talk to you about. There's still time to participate in that. And uh, this is a really good project, in my opinion, because it, it's about students using real data to either confirm or deny that there's a local climate problem. So students need to identify a local problem, a local climate problem, and then they can use data to either confirm or deny. So they can use ground data, they can take their own data, they can get data from places like MetAirn or uh, uh, the Environment Protection Agency or various different uh, sources of data, but they can also use uh, satellite data using ESA's uh, EO browser. So in my opinion, that's a really good project because uh, students really get a chance to use data for a project um, and that's really the essence of what scientists do, I think, is, is to be able to get data, to be able to analyze data and come up with uh, some conclusions. So those are the projects I wanted to mention. They're all, you'll find out more information on the Azero website under the projects section. They're, they're all there, AstroPi, CANSAT, Climate Detectives, Mission X and Mooncam Challenge. So they're all there under the, the um, projects section. I also wanted to share with you, there's a huge number of Teach with Space uh, classroom resources. Now, these are on the ESA website, but if you Google, which is not always easy to navigate, but if you Google Teach with Space classroom resources, uh, that'll bring you to them. And there's two sections, one for primary, one for secondary. Um, and that's just to display some of the fantastic resources that are on the site uh, waiting for you to access. Just to mention then that we do a lot of teacher support, teacher training, teacher CPD, um, and all that information is on the Azero website under teacher support. We don't have anything coming up for the end of the year, but we have a, a full program uh, of teacher CPD for, um, for next year. Um, we'll be doing things on Raspberry Pi. We'll be doing things on um, CANSAT. We'll be doing, uh, we are, our major event for second level teachers is our annual space education confluence, where we bring uh, scientists and engineers in the space sector together with educationalists. Um, and that really is a, a fantastic event. It usually takes place in September or October. A really exciting opportunity that we have next week is an in-flight call with German astronaut Matthias Maurer, who just launched uh, last week to the space station. Um, his mission is called Cosmic Kiss, and we will be doing an in-flight call. We'll be doing it from IT Carlo on next Wednesday. 
Um, but the event will be streamed as well. Um, and you can get information on how to register for that. That's open to senior cycle students. If, if you enjoyed today, I think this is something that you really enjoy. We have a full program of activity planned for the day, including, um, and uh, Niamh will be talking to the ground support crew who supports, um, who supports um, Matthias uh, in his mission and in particular on, on the launch. Um, so some really nice videos with those people from ESA and we'll be linking up and we'll also be hearing about an, a new um, uh, mission coming up very shortly, which I'll talk about in a minute. But you can find out on the Azero homepage how your school can register to to join in the, 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 the live stream of both the program we have around the in-flight call and also the in-flight call itself when students from Carla will be actually able to talk to um, German astronaut Matthias Maurer and to ask questions directly to him. So that's an event that we will, it's been organized by the European Space Agency and we share that with Azero Germany um, and Azero Czech Republic. So that's a really exciting opportunity. I'm really looking forward to that next week. And we'd love to have as many of you as possible register for that. And as I say, you can do it on the Azero homepage, azero.ie. We'll also at that uh, event be talking about the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, that's due to launch, uh, I believe, on the 18th of um, December. Uh, we'll have scientists from Engineer talking, from ESA talking about that uh, launch. And um, we'll also have Dr. Patrick Kavanagh from Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, when I say we'll have them, that, that's at the cosmic, at the um, in-flight call event next week. So that we'll learn more about uh, the telescope itself and the launch and ESA's involvement in that fantastic mission. Um, I just wanted to, to, to share the Azero Twitter handle. It's at Azero, at Azero underscore IE. That's how we promote most of our activities. So it'd be great if you would uh, follow us on that. If any of you have any questions at all, that's my email address, stephanie.oneill at sfi.ie. Happy to hear from teachers. Unfortunately, I'm not uh, allowed to uh, engage with people under 18. So uh, if you do have any questions, uh, do get your teachers to contact me. Happy to take any questions or and to, if you have any, uh, want to find out more about anything that we have going on. Um, finally, before I hand back to Neve. Uh, I do want to share a short video about the European Space Agency. I think it's really important that we know about the European Space Agency and what it does, the types of mission that's involved, the types of satellites that, that, are in, that are, it's responsible for. It, it really does, is involved in a broad selection of, of, of space science, space engineering, space research. Uh, it, it really uh, affects our lives, what the European Space Agency does. I think most people will know about NASA and probably may not be aware of our European Space Agency. And the fact that Ireland is a member of the European Space Agency, I hope you've learned a lot from today, uh, but I'm just going to finish off my section with a short video. It's about four minutes um, about the European Space Agency and the type of work that it does. This is the European Space Agency, dedicated to the peaceful exploration and use of space for the benefit of humankind. Established in 1975, we work together with our 22 member states to push the frontiers of science and technology and promote economic growth in Europe. We have offices in eight locations across Europe and one at Europe's spaceport in French Guiana where we provide independent access to space for scientific and commercial missions. Exploring space is humankind's greatest adventure and one that we have been involved with for more than 40 years. ESA has the technology and expertise to keep Europe at the heart of the new age of space exploration. From low Earth orbit, we are working to bring humans back to the moon and then onto Mars. By expanding the frontiers of knowledge, we are helping to answer the big questions about the universe. Space provides us with incredible opportunities to experiment and discover, yielding amazing new science. From Earth's neighbors to new worlds, we study stars, galaxies, and look for exoplanets. In addition to astronomy, planetary science, and astrophysics, 
ESA scientists work on growing food in space, searching for life on Mars, and understanding our own planet. From space, satellites are watching over Earth to monitor its health. Our satellites improve weather forecasts, observe the long-term effects of climate change, and contribute valuable knowledge to Earth science. The Sentinel satellites for the European Copernicus program provide vital information on our environment that can help improve our daily lives. Satellites also help you find where you are and get you where you want to go. We have developed Galileo, Europe's own global satellite system for navigating the globe. With over 20 satellites and a network of ground stations, Galileo provides precise global positioning information. Satellites are also connecting the world, making possible many of the technologies we use every day, like satellite TV and internet access. ESA is at the heart of Europe's satellite communications, developing new telecommunication systems and nurturing European innovation, bringing industry, science, and space technology together. In order to achieve all this, we need pioneering technologies that push the boundaries of the possible. ESA's world-class laboratories turn science into innovation, developing hardware and software for use in space and on the ground. Space technology gets rigorously tested to ensure it can withstand the harsh environment of space and the journey to get there. Traveling to space reliably is at the heart of ESA's vision for space transportation. We launch rockets that carry satellites into orbit and are constantly improving the design of our next generation of launchers, Ariane 6 and Vega C. These rockets and the reusable space rider will ensure that Europe continues to have autonomous and affordable access to space. Once in space, mission controllers are operating spacecraft around the clock to watch our planet, study the universe, and explore the solar system. We've flown more than 80 missions, including Rosetta, which landed Philae on Comet 67P, and Huygens, which touched down on Saturn's moon. We operate a worldwide network of ground stations to keep in contact with missions anywhere. ESA is dedicated to making space safer. Our teams help spacecraft to avoid collisions with space debris, and we are developing new techniques to deorbit dead satellites. We bring high-tech telescopes to scan the night sky for asteroids and missions to monitor our sun. With these technologies, early warnings can be delivered about potential asteroid impacts or hazardous solar activity that can affect infrastructure on Earth. ESA's diverse activities are all part of a clear vision for Europe in space. Space is the future, and through ESA, we are all part of it. This is ESA. Thanks, Stephanie. Such an interesting video. I never tire of seeing that video. It's so great. There's so much going on at, um, at uh, ESA, isn't there? I know, and it just gives a, a, a broad spectrum of, mm. of the type of work that's, that's going on there. And, you know, it's really important that, that we, that Ireland is a member of that um, yeah. and, and, that, and that we can get involved in it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just there, available to us, and such a great range of speakers um, this morning as well. Um, so, so next Wednesday's event is going to be uh, terrific. So it was with 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 Matthias, with Matthias Maurer, of course, and um, we'll. Um, I might have a few minutes to talk about my own personal um, quest to, to see that launch a, a few weeks ago. But now, um, Bob and Lawrence have returned from the breakout room and now we're going to open up this session for the next, uh, we've got 20 minutes for uh, a wider uh, Q&A session or question and answer session. And just to remind you again, there is a prize for the best question. So it's well worth um, asking questions of, of these people. So um, Rob, can I just check in with you? If you've been looking at the at the YouTube live stream, um, I could keep an eye on questions here, but what, what, what have there any questions that have come in so far that you can see that we can direct at uh, Aidan, uh, Laura or, or Lawrence or even Stephanie at this stage? I'm um, seeing nothing that hasn't already been answered in a breakout room, but seeing as some of the questions were asked in a breakout room, I'd like to open them up to uh, maybe the full panel. Um, yeah, please do, yeah. Here. So there, there was one uh, that was kind of directed at Aidan, um, but it, it 
didn't get asked properly yet. So I'd like to, to throw it out. So Aiden, for instance, is looking at what it's going to be like if we were to live on uh, the moon, um, you know, the, the challenges that we would face. And I suppose there is a lot of talk out there of this idea that the moon or Mars could be our backup uh, plan if everything goes to, to hell on Earth. Yeah. As somebody who's seen the actual challenges of uh, what it's like to try and live on the moon or Mars, how feasible do you think that is? And, and what, what would you guys have to say about that? Shall I begin? Um, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, great question. Uh, people often talk about the exploration of the moon um, and Mars also as a kind of um, you know place second home for humanity. And I think in many cases that's an interesting philosophical discussion to have. Um, I will say that of the two locations you mentioned there, I would preferentially go for Mars rather than the moon. Uh, the moon is a fantastic location to test new technologies, new concepts, and new exploration uh, capabilities. But it's probably not a place where we want to have a sustainable presence for any substantial amount of, of people. It's more of a, a research institute. Think something more like Antarctica, where we have people who shelter there over winter times and spend some time uh, doing research and science there. Um, this is more akin to what we would think something like on the moon would be like in the future. Mars, though, is a different story. Um, obviously, uh, um, we're interested in exploring Mars. We're interested in, in having people potentially visit Mars in the future. Uh, and then you have companies like SpaceX and Elon Musk who talk about Mars as a kind of backup home for humanity in the future. Um, there's certainly a lot of challenges that need to be overcome to make that a reality. Um, but it's not beyond the realms of, of good engineering and, 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 and there are many solutions to some of these challenges out there. Whether they, they would be sustainable homes uh, is, is a question that I can't answer yet, but uh, certainly being able to live there for long periods of time, I think would be possible. Um, but I'd preferentially go from Mars rather than the moon, even though I love the moon. Okay, thanks. Um, have, any of you, have any other panelists thought on, on that particular question? I'll, I'll, I'll add something maybe. I mean, I, well, I think, I think Aiden's, well, Aiden is certainly the expert. So uh, what, what I do think is that um, I think we've moved on you know, already in the last 10 years. There's been some giant leaps, at least in how to, uh, to be able to get to the moon and to be able to get to Mars, where before people would have said, I mean, 30 years ago, well, how, when do you think we'll be able to get to Mars? And uh, okay, people would say, well, by the 2010s, we will be certainly on Mars. And of course, here we are in 2021, <clears throat> and we're far away. But I do think the uh, uh, the the improvement in the access to space uh, with with Elon Musk and the SpaceX, etc., uh, to be able to go to the moon and may and and need to look at the further further field to Mars. I think does the chance of getting to Mars at least in the next ten years. I think is I I have got a lot more confidence than I would have had ten years ago. So uh, I think this is really is is a, is a giant step in in our space exploration. Laura, any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, I guess resonating with both what Aiden and Lauren said, it's it's a super exciting time, and you know the possibility to go to Mars is in the near future and something that we'll see for sure. And I guess in our lifetimes, I guess this idea of being like when things go bad here, let's run away. Like maybe let's focus on making things better here. And let's think properly about climate change and using solutions that we have in, in science and, and the smart technologies we have to maybe you know mitigate some of those effects and take care of our own planet before we run away to the moon or Mars, which are also kind of hazardous places to live, <laughs> you know, even as a solar physicist that we don't want to go there and have, like, as I was talking about, these large solar uh, eruptions that impact us. So uh, I guess that's my my thoughts, but definitely super exciting. And I think it's so cool to be able to see us kind of have a base, have kind of a science base on the moon and then um, hopefully see people on Mars in the near future. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm looking at a, a, a question here on the chat, Rob, I'll, I'll jump in. And it's actually for you, Laura, the first one that's come in is, uh, they're referring to the solar orbiter. So how does such a small satellite, uh, how is it able to capture the information from an object as big as the sun? That's from Finian Corcoran at HFCS in Rathcool. So that's a fantastic question, Finian. Um, and I guess the, the answer is, is that we're still quite far away from the sun. Um, so we can still, you know, when you see the sun, it's still, 
you know, it's not, you're not up close to it. So this is how we're able to take images of it and take these observations. However, in saying that, some of the instruments on board don't see the full sun. They only see a part of the sun. So we need to think of ways of where we're going to point it on the sun. Um, and particularly, this is important when we get really close to the sun. We're going to get better resolution, but see a smaller portion of it. Um, and then things like the probes, of course, are only going to see parts that of the places they're located. Um, but that's a really, really interesting question. And it is, I guess, because we are still quite far away. I think it's going to get close, but it's only going to get like 42 million kilometers. It's still going to be a far, that far away from the sun. So just inside the orbit of, of Mercury. Um, but great question. Yeah, and it's such a great, such a great mission as well. Thanks, Laura. Um, Aidan, I reckon this should be go to you because it's because you're at the Astronaut Centre. The question is from Kolosh that Yosef is how long does it take to be an astronaut? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so if you're one of the lucky few who is selected by an agency like NASA or ESA to become an astronaut, then there's just kind of two stages to uh, graduating you as a full astronaut. You have to go through 18 months of basic training. Uh, they teach you on all the basic skills you need to become astronauts, survival skills, uh, science skills, all this stuff. And then after that 18 months, uh, you get signed on to um, mission training. So they basically be in training you for specific missions. So after 18 months, it can take an extra two years, perhaps, on top of that. So usually about you know three to four years is the kind of time frame uh, we look at for graduating a full astronaut to, to be ready for, for, for his mission to the station. However, uh, this is changing because, uh, first of all, uh, if any of you are watching, obviously, um, the commercial sector, uh, we have commercial astronauts now who are, who are taking off. Uh, in July of this year, we had uh, the Inspiration4 crew uh, who, who flew on a SpaceX capsule around the, around the Earth for three days. Uh, it took them only five months to get the basic training to be able to fly the crew, crew vehicle. So, you know, the, the nature of what an astronaut would be in the future and how much training will, will, will need to actually get to that point is a question that is uh, evolving at the moment. Certainly for the institutionals like NASA ESA, probably a three to four years. If you're going to go with a commercial provider, it could be a lot less. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it certainly is opening up, isn't it? And actually, that brings us to the next question for all three of you um, to, to ask is what is your opinion on spaceflight heading into the commercial sector? So, um, if I say with you, Aidan, and then I'll go to you, Lawrence, and then you, Laura, for that question. So what do you take? What's your take on this evolving commercial sector of, of spaceflight? Well, I think it's great. I mean, um, it's giving us more opportunities to fly. It's, it's uh, reducing the cost for getting people to orbit. And, you know, as you reduce the cost, it means there's more opportunities for people to go to space. And, and you know, as somebody who works in human spaceflight, the more humans I get into space, the happier the happier I am. So for me, I think it's a, a really positive development. Um, I still think it's very important for agencies like ESA, NASA, and, and other space agencies to be part of the, the exploration going forward. I think only agencies like us can actually make the big exploration leaps forward, and then we pave the way for the commercial entities to come in, 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 in come thereafter. So um, going forward in the future, I still think you'll always have uh, agencies like ESA at the vanguard of exploration, but I'm hoping just right behind that, you'll have the commercial actors stepping in to pick up the slack and bring the cost down and make it more accessible for all of us. Yeah, thanks Aidan. Lawrence, what's your take on it? Yeah, I, I of course I agree fully with, with what Aidan has said. I think that there's, you know, when you, when you launch a satellite, I mean, you have a, two parts of the satellite. You have a part called a platform and you have a part called a payload, or it's often the service the instrument module but payload is the part which is uh, you're building a satellite to do something and uh, the, it's the payload is you're paying for this effectively the load to be able to uh, launch it and it's been very very expensive to launch even one kilogram of anything into space before and now the with the the the, the move to this commercial basis it's uh, it's clear that we've got a um that the cost of launching things to space has gone down an awful lot and this i think is really really uh really important uh because cost is 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 the key behind getting into space and being able to get there quite quickly yeah yeah and laura yeah i mean again just agree with both what aiden and lawrence said um i think it, it's fantastic to see you know these opportunities arising in the commercial sector and um, particularly in ireland like there's lots of companies popping up now of, of being able to kind of get contracts with ESA or sell their things or again making space cheaper is always great um, but it you kind of I guess yeah. again to resonate you need to have these you know big agencies like ESA and NASA to, to pave the way and you know we need to start thinking about you know other aspects like space law and things like that you can't just shoot things into space so it's an interesting um, uh, thing that's happening now and I think it's, it's exciting for sure. Um, 
Yeah, it's an interesting time, isn't it? And, and yeah, you're right. Like we need to be careful how it gets managed and, and rolled out and, and space law and those other players are, are, are important parts of it. Rob, I'll come back to you. Is there anything else that came out of the, the breakouts that you think is a question worthy to ask all, all three of our contributors? Um, not one of the breakouts that uh, springs to mind that's more important than the ones that are popping into the chat here, but there was one from, I think it was from YouTube asking uh, Lawrence, yeah. how long you think is before we'll be able to mine comets or asteroids? That's a great. It's a, a good question. A good question. Uh, it it's, uh, it comes down to remember what I mentioned about the cost of getting into space, and um, and this really is 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 the key, especially with the commercial industry. If you can bring down the cost of actually getting into space, then it uh, it uh, it makes more worthwhile to be able to travel to an asteroid to be able to mine it because there's minerals and and there's uh, there's materials on the on the asteroids which uh, have um, which are, cost an awful lot in the earth, but of course are are freely available if you want to call it that in space but nothing is ever freely available in space you've got to pay to get there and you've got to pay to bring it back and so uh, the mining uh, comets i see no proper no no reasoning at all because the uh, in the end it's just a block of ice uh, mixed with dust and so there's no uh, nothing you can get from that but from the um, from an asteroid Certainly, people talk about going to asteroids to mine them. The only way to do that is if it's uh, if you get a profit, which is what uh, people are always interested in is profits. And I just don't uh, see this happening, even with the cost of getting the space uh, going down. I, I don't see this happening for at least uh, a good twenty or so years. But who knows? Maybe maybe it's uh, maybe they'll find something on one specific asteroid which is so unique they'll want to go there, go there and and uh, bring it back. Yeah. Yeah, very true, Lawrence. Thanks. Uh, here's one for all of you uh, from CCCRI. Uh, Laura, Laura, I'll start with you. Why do you think the government of taxpayers should pay taxes for explorations to space when we now have so many problems here on Earth, for example, climate change? I think that's a really, really valid question. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm kind of like, oh, God, I'm going first to answer this question. <laughs> um, no, no, for sure. Like, I mean, that's a very important point. But I think, you know, for space exploration and doing basic research, we're still learning more about, you know, um, our own environment. And, you know, ESA has a lot of Earth observation missions and, and, and projects to kind of understand our own Earth and our own, um, you know, our own climate and how that's changing. And again, um, I think that's really important. So I think from a science point of view, I think we're still learning more every day. But there is a valid point there. You know, we really should be thinking much more about climate change and putting our focus there. But I think what we do and we learn about in space and the technologies that we develop uh, in space exploration can definitely assist that. And I think, you know, I think if you talk to any uh, scientist in the space industry, they're always going to be climate change is very important. And as a scientist, we want to really consider that. But uh, I don't know. I'll have a think a bit more. But yeah, that's a good it's a definitely a good, good question. Um, it's a big it's a big question. A Aiden, what would you how would you respond to that question? Yeah, I'd, I'd resonate with what Laura was saying there and, and also reference like what Stephanie showed in the ESA video. Uh, we have a constellation of satellites called Sentinel, which are watching the Earth's atmosphere and giving us information about the, the state of our atmosphere and telling us exactly what's happening with climate change. And that's all enabled by ESA, by, by space exploration. And um, just an anecdote for another example of how space exploration helps us address climate change. The technology we develop for exploration has a huge impact on the technology we, we use here on Earth. And one great example of, of a uh, technology that was developed for space that now is helping us solve climate ch climate change issues is solar panels. Um, panel solar panels, when they were first developed, were, were novelties. They were efficiencies less than 1%. They were a clever semiconductor trick, but no one ever thought they'd ever scale. And it was only when the space age kicked off that people realized they needed this technology to be developed so that they could actually power the satellites. And, and even for many, many decades, uh, it was so expensive to make these panels that they only ever really existed in space. But the, the learning we got from developing those panels, the technology we got from the, from making those panels, that all fed back down. And now terrestrial PV, it's like one of the biggest solutions to energy crisis we're going to face. You know, efficiencies of up to 21% now. And th this is all directly linked to the, 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 the driving factor, which was space exploration. So there's an example of a technology we probably wouldn't have in our arsenal if we didn't invest in space. Yeah, very, very true. And and Lawrence? So I think, I mean, it's, of course, it's a, it's a valid point. I mean, we put money into space when there, we've got our own problems on the earth, but I think it's it's been answered quite rightly by the others. So the, the reality is that, that uh, 
Um, we can, we can we, in order to try to fix the problems we have in Earth, we have to understand uh, the, understand the causes of what's what's uh, create the problems in Earth. But to get this, you need a global view, and in order to do that, you need to get into space. You know, and and this is where ESA, which has a very a hugely significant uh, Earth observation program, is actually putting a lot of money, a lot of effort. That's one thing. The second thing is that the taxes which you, which the Irish are paying, which it's true, they're paying towards the the the, the um, projects which we have uh, with ESA. The ESA is is uh, is not just taking this money and running away with it. What we do is we call it we've got a process called geographic return. Uh, what it means is that the government puts in money to ESA, and ESA returns this with contracts. So basically, what we're doing is the the companies. Ireland are actually being paid with the money that ESA is putting in, that uh, Ireland is putting into into ESA, and uh, and this is 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 great for those who who are uh, uh, for building things for satellites or whether they're actually looking at space applications, like which you mentioned for innovation. A lot of companies I've seen a lot of companies, but especially in Ireland, which are looking at the output of these Earth observation satellites and benefiting from this, and all based on on money which they receive back from ESA from the initial uh, Irish input. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it is. It's money that's that's well well invested and stuff. Uh, Aidan, I might ask you this one: What sort of advances have we made in the growth of food in space? Uh, yeah. So we're, um, I'm not a biologist, so I can't tell you too much about it. But uh, we've done a lot of work on 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 trying to improve our life support systems in space. So basically, making uh, our, our presence inside something like the ISS more circular so we don't need as much resources and we're also looking into how we can grow uh, certain plants like for example we've been able to grow things like lettuce and also some peppers I believe uh, on board the space station now uh, also a uh, small fish as well have been have been grown on board the station oh. so there is work being done on this and understanding how we can uh, you know actually grow plants the good news is the plants do seem to grow uh, you know, there, there, there's no biological blocker there. They get a little bit confused by the lack of gravity, but uh, um, that's understandable. Um, but perhaps somewhere on the moon and Mars, this may not be a big issue. So, you know, there's no showstopper here as to growing plants on in space or on other surfaces. Um, you just need to bring the right nutrients and the right uh, material with you to make it happen. So, um, people are still looking into this. They really want to understand a little bit more about the science of what's going on in the plant. Um, but overall, it's not a uh, not a crazy idea. It's something we'll have to, to, to bring forward and it looks very, very possible. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Aidan. Rob, back to you. Yeah, I, I would just like to, to very quickly jump in, not with a question or a comment, but uh, reiterating the one about why we should uh, invest in, um, in space exploration. Uh, I think that everybody gave yeah. a good um, answer and I think it's a great opportunity to remind people about the Creating Our Future initiative because um, it'll help you make, you know, make your opinion. Now, do you think Ireland should invest more in the space industry uh, or not, maybe? Uh, but I would definitely encourage you, whatever your opinion, to go to creatingourfutures.ie to uh, submit your question um, or submit your suggestion on what, what Ireland should be doing because it is your future and it is the Ireland that you're going to grow up in. Uh, I have to say, I've never seen so many questions in a Space Careers Roadshow before, so I have to thank you all for, for throwing so many through. Um, it's going to be difficult to get through all of them. Um, so we have one from Kosh to Chris Rhee, where they're asking, what future projects do you think are the most exciting and interesting? Maybe I can start. Um, so I'm, I'm horribly biased because there's one topic that I love uh, researching, which is the topic of using... Uh, resources you find on other planets to to sustain yourself. So at the moment, if we went to the moon, for example, we have to bring all our cargo with us all the time. Uh, we have to be resupplied constantly from Earth. And uh, this is not a good way to do sustainable exploration. We want to be independent so that when we go to somewhere like Mars in the future, we can actually use the resources we find locally to sustain ourselves. Um, so there's a project happening in ESA at the moment. Uh, uh, it's a topic called in-situ resource utilization. And it's looking into building a small pilot plant that we're going to fly to the moon and this plant is going to take uh, some regolith material from the surface of the moon, put it into a reactor, and break down this regolith into its uh, compounds and atomic um, um, uh, makeup. And uh, from that, you'll actually get a lot of oxygen and other interesting valuable materials. And this is the first step towards actually being able to, you know, live off another planet. To take these resources that you find there, do some clever alchemy, and, and actually produce a product. And that's uh, that's a huge change is to how we normally do business in space where everything is flowing from Earth. In the future, we can uh, use this technology to live off the land. 
It's fantastic, isn't it? It's just, it's such an interesting area, you know, looking at what you have and then and making the most from it. And it's such a smart way of doing it instead of kind of bringing, bringing stuff there. And then for long-term sustainability as well on the moon, you know, if you can, if you can make it there, that's not better. That's brilliant. Um, question here for Lawrence. Have you ever been to space and what was your favorite part of the process? Interesting. Oh, well, I'm well, I'm not an astronaut, um, so for sure it's uh, I, I can confirm I've never been to space. Um, I applied yeah. for the the astronaut program quite uh, quite a, well, not this one, uh, but the last one, and I, and I did reasonably well. But uh, uh, in in all honesty, my wife was when she heard I applied was actually ready to kill me because uh, you have to spend. She was saying you have to spend some time up in up in in, in freezing cold areas and stuff, and she just didn't want to move for Spain, and that's understandable. In fairness, I mean, I think. Um, would I would I love to go to space? I mean, I would love to go to space. I would love to. I mean, with, especially with the commercial programs that are there, uh, there are possibilities in the future. I think um, there's also this what's called zero gravity flights, and I know that Neve has taken one of those. That's also something which I which is in my future that I'd like to plan for. Um, but uh, so the overall process, I think it's uh, I think it's uh, it's it's for the, the those who are uh, who are listening now. Um, I think you're the ones who have to, who should be dreaming and should be aiming for space. I think I'm I'm happy now to stay on the ground and actually help help you get there and help you to uh, um, find things which which will will help motivate you to um, to join the space field. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you know, at the moment, of course, ESA is going through its applications of of the next round of selection. So hopefully, some Irish people might emerge from that. You know, that that would be terrific. And long term, maybe we might have our own very first official ESA Irish astronaut, which would be, we should be terrific. Rob, how much time have we left for questions? Because they're, they're still coming in. So what, what do you think we should do? We are running low, but I think we've uh, enough time. Yeah. One more question before well, I- You pick uh, one there. I can't, I can't pick, you pick one. I can't, I can't choose. All righty. There's, there's so many um, great ones. <laughs> okay, as a childhood dinosaur nerd, I think I have to ask this one. Do you think it is vital to okay. make kind multi-planetary in order to be, prevent us from uh, becoming extinct? Like the uh, the old dinosaur. Okay. Laura, you start there. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, I guess. Yeah, um, I mean, this kind of begs the question of you know we're still learning lots, and Aidan probably talked a little bit more about like how do humans work in space? You know, will we be able to reproduce in space? What would happen if you were pregnant in space and things like that? So I think we're still a long way off, but uh, I don't know. I think it's now maybe in our lifetime that we could maybe have a base as we talked about on another planet, maybe on, on Mars. But again, going back to this idea that maybe hopefully we'll think of smarter solutions to save our own planet before we need to go running away to another planet, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, very smart. I, 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 would, I, would, I would echo that. Uh, Lawrence, what about you? So, sorry, what was the question? Because the line was do very you, bad for a second. Do you think it's vital to make humankind multi- planetary in order to prevent us from becoming extinct Oof. do you think it's That's an amazing question um big but, question yeah I, I mean i think the the uh, there's two aspects to it i mean the first one is um uh, i mean clearly the, we, we we have to go back to the, the, it's it's a stepwise process isn't it we've got to make, get back to the moon if we can get back to the moon then we can go on to mars but even living on mars is is going to be very tough because it's quite an extreme environment uh, and then when you look at uh, the project i'm working on this plato mission which uh, still got some time to launch, where we're looking for an Earth-like planet around another star. If we ever find a, star, a planet uh, that we can live on around another star, just the technologies we need to be able to go half the speed of sound, half the speed of light, for example, is it's a giant technological leap, which we, we have some way to go. So um, do you think we make the home? I, I, think, I think in the end, uh, looking at how much it costs to get to space, even though the cost has gone down, um, and looking at how difficult it is to the space environment, I think we the, the, the near term, and I'm talking about the next hundred years, has to be focused on what Laura said. We've got to focus on our home. We've got to focus on on trying to ensure that our that we're not making things worse for our planet. We should be trying to make things better. We should be monitoring from space, of course, but we should be learning from this and trying to make things uh, more livable here. And um, uh, one step at a time. Maybe in the next uh, hundred years or so, we, we, when we find this other other planet, we might go. But um, well, but if that happens, then I hope to see you all standing on Mars first, and then we can look at uh, the next uh, the next uh, star. Yeah, thanks, Lars. And then lastly, you, Aidan, what do you think about that question? 
Yeah, it's, it's also a great question. Um, I, I think it's uh, it's really important that we get out there and 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 go to these other places and explore there. But I, I agree with, uh, with 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 Lawrence there in the sense that um, the first hundred years or so, I'd say it'll probably just be outposts in these locations. These are not going to be uh, cities. These are not going to be uh, self-sustained, uh, even though we're trying to improve that. And um, these these will be like small, you know, small colonies perhaps, uh, but not much else. Um, and, you know, if you look at the history of exploration, that's the way it always has been. Like they go to these locations, they set up a small colony and they're still very, very, very dependent upon their home country to send them supplies, to help them build up. Only at a certain point that it becomes truly self-sustaining. We're a very long way from anything like that. So I don't think we're at a state where we need to um, um, worry about moving to another planet. We still need to fix the problems in ours first before we can uh, uh, jump off Earth. But uh, uh, certainly we need to go there. And I think the technology we will develop going to these places would have a big impact on what we do on Earth as well. Yeah, and, and you know, everything we learned about space, we can we can relate back down to Earth. So it's a bonus for us anyway. So, OK, thanks very much. I think we should come to the end of our, of our question section. Um, Rob, what's going to happen now? Tell us what happens next. Right. Uh, myself and the, uh, the panelists are all going to pop into a breakout room very quickly to chat about the questions and which ones they think are the best. And we'll come back and then let Niamh know and she can uh, announce who the winners are. Uh, it will be just a couple of minutes, so uh, Neil will be able to chat away to you. Um, just going back to Aiden's, um, there was a question for Aiden there about what we're looking like uh, in terms of growing food in space. Uh, Neve, I don't know if you've uh, planned to chat about anything in particular, but I saw a really cool uh, mission about uh, bees and how, how you would keep bees in um, one of these lunar analog missions. And we would have bees to, to fertilize the or to pollinate the plants and all that kind of stuff. So maybe that's something that you'd have some insight in because I know you've done some of these analog missions yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have. And I also wrote a show, uh, which Aiden helped me write actually. My third theater show was about me going to Mars with bees to pollinate plants, <laughs> but it was fictional because yeah. it was set in 2036. But uh, yeah, that's what I did. I was actually going to talk about the my trip to NASA actually last week because oh, I think awesome. it's in keeping with with Matthias and, and all that kind of stuff. I just have a few videos and stuff and just talk about like that I waited for the first two launch dates and then I had to kind of come home for, for a science week. So I have a few videos and things. Maybe maybe I'll do that Brilliant. as well. But yeah, like, um, yeah, I'll do that then. Okay, well, you guys awesome. head away. I won't, I won't keep you, I won't keep you long. And I'll just basically stop talking once you guys come back because I'm conscious of, of time and everybody has to move on with the rest of their day. But um, I'll just see, can I share my screen? Oh, I can, brilliant. Okay, cool. I'll just get going. Awesome. Awesome. See you in a moment, guys. Thank you. See you guys. See you in a moment. All right. So while we're waiting for the judges to deliberate, let's talk about what's kind of been coming up a lot uh, in these talks is uh, missions to the um, International Space Station. And it's a really exciting time because, of course, we're now moving on to um, missions where we're launching again from America, which only kind of started last summer. Um, first in October was the very first mission where we saw launching from Kennedy Space Center. And before that, of course, all launches had to take place for the last 10 years in Kazakhstan and in Baikonur Cosmodrome. Are you okay there, Lawrence? You should be in the breakout room with the rest of them deliberating. Did you get your, did you get your request to go to the breakout room? I think he's, he's okay. I'll leave him with it. I'll keep talking. So anyway, this was the first crew, crew one, and actually they gave a press conference um, there last night about it. So, so what's great about these missions is that they are traveling on uh, a craft, which is, um, which is hired uh, by NASA, uh, hired by, yeah, hired by NASA to use the SpaceX Crew Dragon and its reusable rocket, which is the Falcon 9. So they're very exciting launches and we get to see the rocket returning back down to Earth and everything. And uh, we've seen the second crew, uh, Crew 2, which of course we had a, our, our European astronaut Thomas Pesquet on that, a French astronaut who ended up commanding that mission. And he returned um, last week weekend and uh, we've had a few interviews from him of course and then just last Wednesday finally we saw Crew 3 launch and Crew 3 was a crew of three um, astronauts from NASA and one of our very own astronauts from the European Space Agency a German material scientist very much like what Aiden does called Matthias Maurer and this is the patch 
Crew-3 there. Uh, you see the three in the flame of the Crew Dragon spacecraft. And again, this was a, a chance for our second European astronaut to go up to the International Space Station. And he finally went up last Wednesday. And of course, there's been drama since he went up on his very first night there. They had to evacuate back into Crew Dragon and the, the Soyuz spacecraft for the Russians because there was um, the uh, there was an exp uh, Basically, an, an, a satellite was um, was destroyed, causing all sorts of debris and heading towards the International Space Station. So for a few hours, they were in danger and they had to go back to their own uh, Dragon. So I was um, I got to go to the Kennedy Space Center. Um, I was there from the 28th of October until the 2nd of November, and then I had to go home. And so uh, I was part of the uh, ESA media team. I was the only English speaking media team there. And so uh, as part of that, um, I got to go on site at the, to the Kennedy Space Center and I got to see the actual rocket. So this is the Falcon 9 that they flew on. And on top of that was the Crew Dragon that they flew in, which was the endurance uh, uh, capsule, which is now, of course, stationed at the um, International Space Station, because finally they did launch. They were initially scheduled to, to launch on Saturday night, the 30th of October, around about, um, I think it was like around one o'clock in the morning. So um, I had my press pass and everything to do. And, and uh, I, the European Space Agency had invited me to watch the launch with them on the top of this building. And for those of us who are space nerds, this is a, a really important and kind of iconic building on the NASA Kennedy um, uh, site, because this is where the Saturn V rocket was assembled. And so the Saturn V rocket is, um, bar Starship, which is being built by SpaceX, which will ultimately um, fly to Mars. It is the biggest rocket ever built, and it was the rocket that carried the Apollo spacecraft to the moon. And of course, which ultimately got us to have our first humans uh, on the moon. No woman yet, but um, that's coming very soon. So the uh, Saturn V was assembled there. And actually, as I was there, the, uh, the space launch system, SLS was also assembled there and the final piece was added to it just in the last few weeks, which is the capsule to contain the humans, uh, which are, uh, which is known as the Orion spacecraft and the European Space Agency has had some input in the construction of the Orion spacecraft. So that's there. And uh, this is an incredibly large building. I think you kind of, you can't really uh, fathom how big it is. Um, when you see it, um, if I just stand in front of it, maybe you, you'll understand a little bit better. So it's 150 metres high. So for those of you that have been in Dublin and have seen the spire on O'Connell Street, the spire is 25 metres high and the spire goes way above all the other buildings on, on O'Connell Street. So it would be six spires. That's how big it is. And so this, this building is enormous. And the opportunity to see that, um, to see a launch from the top of that would be pretty incredible. So um, I waited around. So, so the launch was postponed. Um, we got word late Saturday, late Friday night, early Saturday morning. So um, I was just down the road a, a few kilometers away and I had all my plans made uh, to come back on site for the launch for late Saturday night. And around about 4 a.m. on Friday, they had to postpone the launch because of adverse weather. And so they moved it on to the Tuesday night. And then uh, there was a minor uh, illness with one of the crew, so they postponed it. And then finally, they launched last Wednesday night. And so thankfully, Matthias is safely up on the space station. And now I see our adjudicators are back, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to go back to Rob to tell us, or Stephanie, to announce who uh, won the uh, best question award. So um, Stephanie, maybe, or would you like no, to No, no, I, I didn't go out to the breakout room, so oh, Rob would be announcing. We leave it to uh, Rob. Yeah, so it, it, was, uh, it was a tough one. We had a couple of favorites. Uh, we, we almost came to a point us, but we, we chatted it out. And, uh, the, the favorite question came from Kalosh to Chris Dree, and it was asking why uh, we should be investing so much in uh, space exploration when we have all these problems here on Earth. We think it, it led to a really, really good conversation, um, and it, it shows yeah. the benefits of space exploration um, can actually yield results here on Earth as well. So that was a fantastic question, but they were all fantastic questions, and thanks a million for having mm. me, guys. I'm going half uh, batty here trying to keep up with them and scribbling them onto the pieces of paper. So thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, they're yeah, 
they're really, really great questions, actually. And, and I think a great session, a great morning. Um, you know, all that's really left for us to do is to, is to thank everyone. Um, uh, I, I've been delighted to be a part of it. We had great and Laura, thank you again, Aidan, and thank you again, Lawrence, for everything that you contributed. And it's been a terrific morning. Thank you so much, Rob and Alan and Danielle in the background. Ha Stephanie, I'll hand it back to you to, to for final closing. Yeah, I think that's one of the best roadshows we've had in terms of questions. So yeah. thank you thank you to the teachers and thank you to the students for participating um, and for being so engaging and for, for really using the opportunity. Definitely one of the, the, the most questions we've ever seen at, at a roadshow, as, as Rob said earlier. So thanks very much. Uh, thanks for your interest. We'd love to see you uh, registering for the in-flight call next week. Unfortunately, we can't invite you to it. It's, it's just a local event in Carlo. We, we had to reduce our numbers uh, because of COVID. But we are streaming as a, because it's really exciting events. So go to esero.ie. Details are on the homepage. Um, and you can register your school there to, to join in for the um, for the streaming of that event. So it'll be really exciting. And thank you again. Thanks, everyone. And there'll be surveys posted out to you uh, in, the, uh, in the couple of days ahead. So, so please complete them. So, so thanks again. Oh, yeah, just great to that, that's really important yeah, yeah, for us yeah, because yeah. if we're offering these kind of events, we really need yeah, to know yeah. what's working for you. Uh, do, does this format work for you? More importantly, what's not working for you? So we really want to know how can we improve these events for you, uh, the teachers and the students uh, in the school. So please, please, please give us your feedback. Even if it's negative, we, we really want to hear um, how we can make these events better for you. So that's it, everyone. Uh, thanks again. We just super, super, super panel. Laura, I see, I see that you're still here with us. Thank you so much again. It was, it was great hearing your insights. You were, you were just terrific, and for, and for your generosity of time. We've, we've Lawrence and, and Aidan have had to go, but they said goodbye. So thank you again. We don't have an event without three great contributors. So it's, it's all about you. So, um, thanks again to you all, and uh, enjoy the rest of Science Week, and stay safe. And hopefully, we might see you on the uh, in-flight call next week. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Bye.